Ladies and gentlemen, it is Tim Dillon, and welcome to the Tim Dillon Show Christmas episode. We're very, very excited. We're bringing you a special treat. We're taking a famous 20-minute rant uh, from the Patreon archives called My Last Christmas, which is about why I decided to retire from spending the holidays with my family. Only partially retire. I do go back occasionally for holidays, but it's really just kind of... uh, this kind of epic rant that a lot of people connected with about really trying to get rid of your family and friends and trying to level up. That's what the holidays to me are about. Thinking about what you have in your life and what you can get rid of, who you can get rid of, how fast you can do it and how quickly you can leave those people in the dust and ascend to higher levels. That's what I believe the holidays are about. They're about taking stock of where you are, and who you are, and trying to change both of those things dramatically and immediately, if possible. So I did this rant, and it was about a Christmas that I had, and it was a Christmas that shook me to the core. It made me realize that it was time to enter a new phase of my life, and a lot of people have connected with it. So we hope you enjoy it. If you don't enjoy it, it's probably because you're threatened by it, because you know I'm right. Or maybe you are one of these people that I don't understand that thinks the holidays are about togetherness and just making do with what you have. A lot of people feel that way. They're like, the holidays are just about being grateful and thankful for what you have. Shut the fuck up. That's not what they're about. They're about saying, I want more. <laughs> okay. Enough. Stop lying to yourself and others. Stop denying yourself. You're an animal. You're on earth. You're an animal. Now, obviously, there's maybe some divinity. You have the ability to reason. You know, maybe there is a God. Maybe you can, I'm not saying you have to stay an animal, but you have, you know, you have instincts. You have, a, there's a nature to you. You want things. There's nothing wrong with that. Stop denying yourself the pleasures of, of getting rid of people. The holidays are just about looking around and saying thank, f- thank you for this shitty job and this even <laughs> shittier family. No, they're not. The holidays are about driving by a big, beautiful house with a big, beautiful wreath on the door and a big, beautiful Christmas tree and looking at that house and going, I want that. I want that. I want that warmth, that security, and that safety, and I deserve it. And you know what? A lot of the people in my life right now aren't helping me get that. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pretend I don't know them because our friendship's based on mutually assured destruction, that we both destroy each other. And my family is just based on we're just a bunch of people who don't know. We, we don't know what the hell we're doing anymore. We're all just staring at each other. Some of that's nice, but the majority of it isn't. And we know that. We're eating garbage food and sweatpants. We're phoning it in. We're throwing a lot of good money after bad. So that's what the holidays have always symbolized to me. And I know people have all kinds of different views about it, and I don't hold that against anyone. But the reality is the holidays are about, it's, it's a quarterly review for your life. It's the end of the fiscal year or the quarter or whatever, and you say to yourself, listen, let me figure it out. Let me figure it out. And that's what the holidays are about. Looking around at people going, who's essential, who's not? So that's the first part of the episode. Second part of the episode, we talked to the great Sal Volcano is one of the impractical jokers. It is the most successful, you know, whatever you want to call it, prank show, which they're not really fans of that name. They don't like reality show either. You know, it's, it has elements of a game show, but it is a hybrid. It's a, a few different genres. And it's one of the most successful shows in the last decade. It's a worldwide phenomenon. Those guys sell out arenas all over the world. And, it, and, and, and they all experience success in their late, th- in their mid thirties. Very interesting story about how they came together, how long they all worked day jobs, how long before they started making money. And then just, you know, the show growing into the fucking powerhouse that it is today where it's a worldwide sensation and everybody knows about it. And Sal's an insanely famous person. When I've gone out with him to dinner, people 
always recognize him. It's, it's, it's really insane, especially in New York City, but pretty much I'm sure wherever he goes, there are people out there. So it's very interesting talking to him about that. Um, so that's really the episode today. We have those two things happening. Is this our final episode of the year, Ben? No, we have one coming out on the twin on the thirtieth, I think. Because fucking month sucks. Yeah, you can't. As my father said, can't get ahead. Can't get ahead. They, they're always trying to get you. They'll get you. Can't get ahead. I spent a lot of time. We released a boomer Christmas video. That's funny. Spent a lot of time with the boomers over the last week. They're they're great people, and they're very fascinating to me. Because what's great about the boomers is, and I've talked to different boomers from different tax brackets all over the place, different locations, the sense of injustice that they all have about the things that they've been denied, what I love. Just, they're just, they're somehow all victims. Many of them have inherited homes, victims, you know? Then you got to renovate those homes. What a project. Many of them, you know, worked at one company for 40 years. That's not going to happen anymore to anyone we know. And I'm not saying these people should be derided, but I'm just saying I love the idea that it's like still like, oh, it's rough, man. It's rough. It's been rough. You have no idea how rough it's going to get. Um, so it's a really it's a really fun episode, and uh, maybe you like it, maybe you don't. Subscribe to the Tim Dillon Show, rate, review, leave a five star rating. We do appreciate that. Tell friends and family. Thanks to everyone who bought the shirt. Send us photos of you in the shirt. We'll put it up unless you're completely hideous. We're kidding. We'll put it up even if you're hideous. Doesn't matter unless you're like deformed. If you're like Elephant Man. Well, actually, if you are Elephant Man, we will put it up. Like, if you are deformed, we'll put it up. If you're just kind of regular ugly, I don't know that it helps me or you. But if you're really good looking or deformed, I'd like one of the extremes. I don't need you to just be like plain Jane, you know? But, you know, let me know. Let me know how you feel, folks. Send me the... uh Send me the photos. Also, live dates, a lot of them coming up. TimDillonComedy.com, all over the place. We're going to Austin, Texas uh, in January. We're going to Magoobies, January in Baltimore, Maryland. We're going up to Toronto, coming back to Caroline's in New York City in March, headlining those rooms. So please check out TimDillonComedy.com. All the links for tickets are on the website. Enjoy the episode. We'll be back. We got another episode coming on Patreon with Luke Radowski, the guy who stormed Epstein's Island in the Virgin Islands. He's going to come on the show. Also, we have Patreon is coming up with always the great Ray Kump. And, um, you know, folks, we'll have more shirts working on a Megan McCain shirt that could be epic, but it's got to be done the right way. Got to be done the right way. I know somebody that knows her. They were with her the other night. She's not a fan of me. Understandable. <laughs> and uh, we're working on that. We are working on that. Be great to do Rogan with her, me, as her, her, as her, Joe, as Joe. <laughs> Fun times. When does this come out? Oh, tonight. Mm -hmm. Merry Christmas, everybody. Happy New Year. Happy Kwanzaa. Happy Hanukkah. Happy winter solstice. Happy fucking holiday. Whatever the Saturnists are, Sam Tripoli will know what holiday they fucking celebrate. Happy holidays. Somebody on Little St. James is singing like in that Robert Goulet voice. Happy holidays. <laughs> fucking wild fucking world we live in, man. It's truly unhinged to an alarming degree really is not much can be done. This is how the boomers become the boomers, by the way, I'm going to become the same thing. People are going to come to me in, you know, 20 years if I'm still around and they'll be like, Hey, the fuck's going on. And I'll be like, can't get ahead. 
They're always trying to get you. They're going to be like, satanic pedophiles run the whole government. I'm going to be like, not good. <laughs> Got to make time to golf. Hit, hit the ball a little bit. Play nine. Take some time. They can be like, aren't you outraged? Be like, buddy, we were outraged years ago. We were outraged decades ago. But then we decided that there's not really much left to do except eat meatballs and wait for death. Got to take a moment for yourself. You know? I'll, you know, whatever, I'll be going to see whatever act is like an old act at that time. I'm like, I'm going to see Lizzo. She's on her comeback tour. You know, she lost her foot. Diabetes, <laughs> but she's back. She's playing the hits. So that's it, folks. That's what's going to happen. Boomers weren't born boomers. They became them. And I understand. And I, I, it's, you know, all these politically active people that are on the right and the left, far right, far left, they're going to realize that the system's just going to crush them like everybody else. Don't call it a black pill, you stupid fucks. Oh, you're so black pilling. It's not a black pill. It's the pill. <laughs> it's the only pill. Go get a fucking life. Go get married, have kids, do whatever you want to do. Don't cocoon yourself on Twitter with another with a, with a bunch of losers. It's not going to work. The revolution's not coming. Shut up. Go find something to fucking do. I'm not saying don't be, you know, concerned. Don't care, but care about real people in real life. Fucking jump on the hashtags. Shut up. Get a life. How about in 2020, you get a fucking life? Stop talking about Elizabeth Warren and Donald Trump. They don't care about you. doesn't matter to them. You're a statistic on a sheet. Either take care of yourself, you'd you be eaten alive. It's the truth. You don't want to think like that? You think your tweet's going to save you? You think one of these sociopaths who spends their time eating children is going to turn around and like you, you know, like you? You think uh, you're going to send them a letter about your papa don't work at the factory and they're going to be, oh, I got this letter about a baby. Ba, ba, ba. Shut up. Grow up. you grown up. Go to Washington, D.C. Walk around. It's all demons from hell. It's all it is. All the people that write about politics, talk about politics, they're so, these are kids who've never been invited to parties. They've never had any fun. They've never laughed. They just, they're like drones. They've had their souls replaced by teleprompters and fucking listicles. These peoples, you look in their eyes, there's nothing there. They just go on MSNBC or Fox and they spout inane nonsense. And you people, oh, oh, look what this one said. Look what that one said. <laughs> no, no. Get a fuck. Go be somebody. Go start a fucking drug business or become a crisis actor. Go f fake terrorist attacks. Go do something real. You know? Uh, we will be, uh, I'll be putting out on the Patreon an article about the Boston Marathon bombing. If you want to talk to your family over the weekend about something, Merry Christmas. Why can't we hear from Dokar Zarnayev? Happy holidays. Why does Dokar Zarnayev not able to give an interview? <laughs> Is it because the FBI used him and his brother as informants and then said they didn't know who they were and that they probably were not sophisticated enough to make that bomb? Maybe the FBI allowed them to have a bomb so that they could catch other people with bombs and then that bomb went off and then they decided to lie and say that they didn't know who they were and then they got caught in a boat and one of them was shot. They were clearly trying to shoot both of them and then they also killed a cop on MIT for no reason. They didn't even really try to get away. They just drove around on Boston Happy holidays. <laughs> um, you know, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Hi. That's my new attitude in 2020, that voice. Hi. Hi. I'm in a, I'm in 
uh, com- comedy now has been invaded by wealthy white women. All, every night you just perform to Ugg boots, Ugg boots and three hundred and four hundred dollar sweaters that just stare at you. They want you to talk about dating and avocado toast. I just want to know, is this Jeff serious or not? That's what they want to talk about. They're all just Chardonnay. Chardonnay and Ugg boots. It's a misery and a horror. Life's an unending, merciless hell. Enjoy the holidays, folks. If you have a turkey, let me say this before I leave. If you have a turkey again on Christmas, you're a fucking psychopath. You should have turkey on Thanksgiving. And at Christmas, you have a meat. You have Chateaubriand, filet mignon, you have steak. You know, you have maybe a ham. You have pasta, seven fishes. You know, pasta like a lasagna, whatever. You don't have turkey again. If you have turkey again, it's you're from a sick place with sick people and you need to get away from them ASAP. (laughs) If you're going to someone's holiday for the first time and they're having turkey, get the fuck away from them. Get away from them. I wish if I could do it all over again, I'd be heterosexual. I'd be a banker. I would date one of these fucking Ugg boots that I have to make laugh. And we would go to Ugg boots house and we, we'd, we'd meet mother Ugg. Mother Ugg would be, Drinking maybe a little brandy, and she'd go, hello, hi, Colton. My name would be Colton, and I'd have a Patagonia jacket and leather boots, and I'd say, hello, my name is Colton. I went to Princeton, and she'd say, hi, Colton. My name is Felicity, and this is my husband, Benson. And he'd say, hello, Colton, I'm Benson. You uh, know, I went hunting earlier this year. And we'd be in secret societies and we'd wear hoods and we'd go in the middle of a field. I don't know what they do. They probably do like a big dance number where they're like, Satan is great. Satan is great. Satan is great. But whatever. Okay. But I'm not in the fucking green room of a comedy club. I got to entertain a bunch of Ugg boots. Is it going to be funny? I don't know. Would Tina Turner have been good if she didn't get smacked in the face? <laughs> yes or no? These are questions for the, the holiday Christmas. Or would she have phoned it in? How do, you, how do you get what's love got to do with it? You get that if you're happy? No. Stop wanting your entertainers to be happy. There's a lot of entertainers that are happy and healthy, and that's why everything is dog shit. It is dog shit, and you like it. Because entertainment now is just something that you know happened, you dumb fucks. Oh, he's talking about Uber. I take Ubers. <laughs> entertainment. That's not it. That ain't it. <laughs> the highest sacrament now is being relatable. How disgusting is that? That You have to go into their world. They don't want to come into your world. You have to go into their world and their fucking dumb world. Their dumb world, whatever these retards are talking about. Ugh. It's disgusting. I got to go now and perform for the sor- sorority that's here. Fucking Fairfield, Connecticut, snow bunnies. I'm going to have to get up there and tell them the truth. Tell them that the country is run by a cabal of demons. <laughs> that's what I'm going to tell them. And I will also do jokes about the death of the diner. <laughs> Declining quality of Wendy's. And other important things that while they might might not be as important are certainly important. Certainly not going to skip over them. Uh, Thank you. You'll let me know when I have to go, right? I love you. Thanks. We're firing everyone after tonight. (laughs) I'm going to fire. I fire everyone. In every comedy club I work, I bring them in. I go, we we, we appreciate it, but tonight's going to be it. (laughs) Tonight's going to be it for you. Thanks for coming. Tonight's going to be it. We've enjoyed it. We hope you've enjoyed it. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. That's how I'd fire. If I had a business, I'd fire everyone like that. I'd go, hey, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. And they'd go, what do you mean? I'd go, you're out. <laughs> That's what I mean. My heart goes out to everybody who's working on Christmas, like myself, by the way. I'm fucking working too, so don't give me nothing. I got seven shows on New Year's Eve. 
So the reality of this situation, folks, is this. Some guy just emailed me, hey, how's next Monday morning or Tuesday morning or even Sunday? For what? Is this guy mentally ill? Oh, this is this. Oh, I like this guy. This is Altucher. I like James Altucher. Yeah, some kid asked me to do the show in Highland Park. No, 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 no more. No more. I'm going to start diving into the audience at these hipster shows and biting people in the face. <laughs> and we'll see how many shows I get asked to do. Hey, was Tim doing funny the other night? You know, he was doing okay, but then he just bit someone's face. The cops had to come. So we're not going to invite him anymore. Yeah, leave me alone. Hey, if you don't own a club, don't message me. Unless you're in Skull and Bones and you fucking, you can get me in. These retards call me. They're like, I'm in the Penn State Skull and Bones. Hey, shut the fuck up. Yeah, I'm in the Nassau Community College Skull and Bones. Shut up, please. You fucking D-list fucking scabs. I can't get a goddamn real elitist. I got these fucking tertiary people, third and fourth tier nobodies messaging me. I'm trying to get an, a, a real elite, a Rothschild, something like that. Getting these fucking nobodies. These fucking, the, the fourth or fifth guy that rounds out the fucking golf trip that nobody gives a shit about. He's messaging me, telling me, yeah, it's, it's really like not even that cool. Yeah, I know it isn't. I'm talking to you. God. Stand-up comedy sucks. It really is the worst art form. I mean, it's the best, <laughs> but it sucks so much. Who's that guy? Fire him. Fire him. He's fired. Who's that? He's getting, I'm firing him. Care who that guy is. Everybody's going to get fired, by the way. It's called, I walk around, fire everybody. Hello, sir. How are you? What's your name again? Tim Dillon, nice to meet you. Have a good holiday. Are you excited about the holiday? You excited about the holiday? Fuck yeah. Are you, you're Puerto Rican? You do not look Puerto Rican. A white guy just walked in and was like, I'm cooking Puerto Rican. Like, what does that mean? You're cooking a Puerto Rican? It's interesting. Well, have a good holiday, sir. We'll wrap this up, folks, because frankly, I'm not paid enough to do what I do. I give you everything for free and you take a shit in my throat. Okay? Every other podcast, he's got nine houses. I'm, I'm struggling to feed that fat cat in L.A., Okay, I should have named my uh, uh, podcast Avocado Toast in Your Pussy. And then I'd have 75 million people listening to it. And I talk about my dry snatch <laughs> like everybody else, because that's what everybody wants. They want to hear about your dry snatch and how fucked up you got in college and at your friend's wedding. Okay, we're not doing that. Okay, we're telling you the truth. And that's hard to fucking monetize. So if I could do it all over again, I'd be a, a single loudmouth Jewess with a dry snatch. <laughs> Goodbye! Hi, I'm Timmy the Trash Can, and I love trash. Popcorn boxes, cups, and candy wrappers. Mmm, they all taste so good. Instead of throwing your trash on the floor, won't you please give it to me? Thank you for considering your fellow patrons. Christmas week is now, this is the week between Christmas and New Year's. When you were a little kid, this was the best week of the year because you could play with all the toys you got at Christmas and you were off from school and all of your friends were off from school and it made it the best week of the year. When you're an adult, this week is harrowing. It's horrible. It's it's like it's like a hangover for an entire week. You don't know what time it is. You don't know what day it is. You're not really you're not at work. Nothing's going on, but you're not also not at work somehow. You're like involved. You know work is coming. It's a nightmare week. It doesn't ever feel like it should be daylight out. You walk outside. It's like if you were ever, if you went to, uh, I went to parties in high school, not to brag. Uh, I went to a few parties and every now and then I used to love drugs and alcohol. So I would wake up the next day at the party house, which by the way, bad move and a real omen of things to come. If you're waking up at the party house, 
it means you have a problem. But what I saw is what you should never see, which is the house the day after the party. It has that dank feel. It smells bad. It's just ashtrays overflowing with cigarette butts, stains from you hope booze. And you're looking around the house and there's just sun peering in, illuminating the filth, which seemed so fun only a few hours before. It seemed okay. The family that embraced this, that lived like this, that opened their home and allowed you to trash it, you thought, these are good people. They let us come in here, do drugs, alcohol with them, with their children. They let us trash the small piece of real estate they happen to own. They let us depress the value of it for several hours. And then we all leave. We don't give a fuck. And if you still leave at 3 a.m. in the dark and you wake up in your house or somebody else's house, you're fine. And that magic still stays with you. And that's an important magic to retain for as long as possible. But when you wake up the next day at the party house and you see it in the day and you see the family in the day, these people, these vampires that are by sunlight, they scatter around like roaches. You say to yourself, this is not good. This is what the week between Christmas and New Year's feels like to a person. You feel like you are seeing something you shouldn't see. You feel like it should go Christmas, and then you have like a an hour or two, and then New Year's party, and then let's go. It's a new year. We're in this weird vortex between the absolute hell and the vapid conversations you have to suffer through with your family. Oh my God, it, does, it doesn't feel like Christmas this year. I don't, you know, blah. the, you know, and I went to my party and this is the end of, and, and I've been pretty open about this. This is my final year uh, spending the holidays with my family. And I will, because I want to be successful. And I've realized that success requires to constantly keep climbing And when I look around these parties, these holiday parties I'm at, I'm like, there's very little room to move up in this structure, you know? There's nowhere to really go. We've done it. Um, And and I'm thankful, and they're good people, these people. But next year, I think I'll go to an island, or I'll get away somewhere, or maybe I'll go spend it with friends. I was invited to spend it with friends this year, and I said, no, I'm going to go and I'm going to spend it with my family. And it was nice. And it was only nice because I I felt like it was kind of the closing of a chapter. Um, And here's my thing. And I'll throw this out there too. Um, The phoning it in of the holidays across the board has got to stop. And this is happening. The older generations are now dead or they're dying. They're bedridden. They can't do anything anymore. They're old. They're there. They're sitting in a chair. We love them. We thank them. But they're not, they're not the captain of the ship. My grandmother is, has died. My nanny has left, but she's not really doing anything anymore. So the responsibility for the holidays falls on the baby boomers, a, a selfish generation of people who have sucked everything out of this country and given it nothing. Um, demonic, uh, drug addicts who were drunk on cheap credit for their entire lives, mortgaged their future, mortgaged our future, disgusting, selfish, hedonistic people without honor, without valor, without intelligence. And I, and, and I say this with all due respect, many of them are fans, but that generation largely, not all of them, but a lot of them, um, it's phoning in time. And, you know, like one of them said to me, and I'm not going to say who, but because this is, you know, it's, this is my family, but it's also there's other people's families involved. And I just observed holidays on Facebook and Twitter, people, paper plates, plastic cups. Is it a GoFundMe? I thought that was a GoFundMe. I thought I was going to take out a credit card and donate to you. Why are you advertising your inability to own glassware? I mean, this is really something that I, I have seen. I've seen these holidays. Look at photos. I'm not making this up. Look at photos of holidays from the 50s, from the 60s, from the 70s, from the 80s. Look at photos of holidays now. Everybody's dressed like a bum. People are sitting in the basement with red solo cups. It's like you're playing a beer pong 
in the basement like a fucking child. People go to supermarkets to cater the meal. Supermarkets where the staff is on heroin. Okay? I went with my father. He goes, we're picking up some food. We're having catered. Not from a caterer. Not from a restaurant. From the supermarket. We went to the supermarket and got the food. Can you imagine? This is the day Christ was born. Come to our house and you could eat supermarket food in the den. This is ridiculous. Why have a holiday? Somebody said to me, they're like, nobody cares where the food comes from. Yes, they do. I do. I do. I don't get it. I also don't get the this potluck dessert where you just give up and you go, well, I'll host, but... I need everybody else to bring dessert because I can't manage to buy a dessert or make a dessert, even though I'm hosting the party and it is my responsibility to ensure that people have a good time. I'm going to just let whatever dirt bags I have coming over stop at some local fucking 7-Eleven and buy a fucking cheesecake and have them bring it over. I'm going to let my, my aunt uh, make a... Chocolate pudding pie that looks like a child made it. Where the crust is uneven and the mousse is overflowing and it looks like a Jell-O no-bake. Remember those? Remember when Jell-O came out and said to fat people, you shouldn't go near an oven, you're fat. But what about if we gave you something you could just stir, put in the refrigerator for a half hour and then eat like a pig on your couch while you watch the Drew Carey show? And it sold well. Sold well, but that's what that's what we're eating. We're eating pudding pie. There was a dessert, I swear to Christ, called dirt. There's a dessert called dirt. These are adults. These were adults. It was a bowl, and they told you how they made it. They weren't embarrassed. They told you how they made it. Whipped cream pudding, cream cheese. It's just this glop. That looks like human shit. And then they take cookies and crumble the cookies up and put them on the top. And then they put gummy worms in it so that it looks like the dirt. How about bringing actual dirt? Could it have been more insulting if you had brought actual dirt with real worms? I mean, this is disgusting. And people eat it like it's okay. Not okay. If you host, you do the dessert. You don't trust people to bring shit to your home. You know what they're going to do. They're going to do it on the fucking cheap. Because they're just going to fucking... Nobody knows who brought what. That's what it is. If you do a potluck dessert, you should have to stand in a circle and go, what did you bring? And you should be judged fucking harshly. But nobody does that. They throw it on the table and they run away to the other room. They don't give a fuck that nobody's eating their garbage fire of a fucking dessert because they're gone. So, again, when I was growing up, we had a New Year's Day party, and um, the New Year's Day party, uh, we had great food, but the dessert was Peach Melba. One dessert. That was it. Now, I know people now, they're like, well, you know, some people are chocolate people. Some people aren't. Some people want cheesecake. You know what, folks? We're trying to please everyone, and we're pleasing no one. That's what we're doing. We're trying to include everyone, and we're including no one. Okay, so it bothers me. Again, I just felt a lot of the food where I was, was was phoned in, phoned in. And I don't like that because I remember when I was growing up, my grandmother and, and my nanny and, he, and the men as well, everybody would help. They would really get into it. They would cook for days. And it was a mark of pride. It was a mark of pride how great the food was. Everyone looked forward to it all fucking year. Now these people go to a supermarket and buy something, they buy macaroni and cheese that somebody stirred in an Oxycontin frenzy in Long Island? I, I, what are we doing? Why are you inviting me to your home? I'm insulted. I, I don't know how you're not insulted. I mean, I, I, I try not to yell, but it gets angry. And I know that everyone says you on Reddit. Everyone's like, you're loud and fat. And that's very instructive. I had no idea. I appreciate that. I appreciate your candor. These guys will hopefully fix the level. It's very tough for me. I know I'll kill Tony. Everyone was like, you're loud. You're loud on it. 
because I'm, I'm playing to a room of people, it's 300 people, and when I get worked up, I get worked up. And, you know, it's not my fault. You should be watching Kill Tony. I don't know who listens to Kill Tony. Kill Tony's a visual experience. You watch it on the live stream. You watch the YouTube. But I am trying. I'm working on that. I'm working on not being as loud. But I get angry. I get angry because there's real issues. There are real problems. I saw people's holidays, and I just – I sit back and I judge on social media. And I think that – listen, I think that I understand people that say, you know what? We're going to use paper and plastic. And you know what? I'm not I'm not saying in every instance that's not appropriate, okay? What I'm saying is that f- the formality of the holiday to me matters and I think you should you should say to yourself, you know what? We're going to we're going to let everybody drink out of big boy cups. And they're going to eat on plates like people. We're not going to give them We're not going to give them plastic knives that break in the food and forts where the fucking things fly off. We're going to give them real utensils because Christ was born today. And whatever you feel religiously, the significance of that event. My stepmother got everybody slippers. She does this every year. She gets a gift for the whole group. Last year it was Snuggies. You know, I always try to talk about 9-11 when she hands out the Snuggies to everybody. Everyone's like, it's so soft. It's so soft. I said, why Why did Building 7 fall? It wasn't even hit. It's just fun. I like to have fun because you end up in these conversations with people that are, are, are vapid and meaningless. People are talking about why they why they decided to become a teacher. Could anything... We know why you decide to become a teacher because you don't like to work and you have nothing to offer the world. That's we get it. We get it. Why'd you become a teacher? You're not a fan of hard work and you don't have anything to offer. That's what that's the only thing anyone should ever say why they became a teacher. Became a teacher. Like it's a fucking like you won the Heisman. You're going to go through your story. Start talking about how you did it. What, What was your origin story? Tell us. Tell us, Haas, you went to college and you realized you wanted to have the two best months of the year off where you did nothing. And you wanted to be done with your job every day by 2.30. Ah, okay. Listen, my grandmother was a teacher. I know a lot of teachers get mad at me because I talk a lot of shit about them like I just did. But the reality of the situation is this. I never shit on teachers until they started saying they had the most important job in the world. Which you do, you don't, it's not even in the top hundred jobs that are important, teaching. You know, here's why. Everyone wants to do it. There's no shortage of people doing it, okay? So if you decide to not go to work tomorrow, there's fucking a trillion people called subs that are there to step in and can do your job immediately. Maybe not as good as you, but they can do your job. They can approximate your job. But this is what you got to do when you're there in the holidays. You got to sit down and you got to tolerate that. You have to tolerate that as an appropriate conversation. Someone in the room telling you why they decided to be a teacher. And you have to sit there and go, yeah, I say you decided that you wanted to teach. You just wanted to be a teacher. Oh, that's great. It's not, it's ridiculous. So we get these slippers and then she's like, everyone put the slippers on. I don't want to put the slippers on. Okay. I want to tie a noose around my neck. Um, but she didn't buy everyone a noose. That would be funny. You know what I got everyone this year? A noose. Funny. She goes, that would be a great gift. She goes, 2019 is going to be rough, but don't worry, everyone. I got us all nooses. That would have been too dark. People would have got upset. So we all put the slippers on to take a photo with everyone with the slippers on, okay, to commemorate this. And then one of my aunts starts... Like we're all standing in a circle with the dumb slippers. One of my aunts like do the hokey pokey and everyone starts doing the hokey pokey. And I'm standing there and I want to kill myself. I literally want to end my own life. I want to grab something sharp and stab myself. And I want my blood to sputter out while everyone's doing the hokey pokey. Because I'm like, this is fucking crazy that this is going on right now. The hokey fucking pokey. We're all adults. There's no children here. There are no kids. This is an important distinction. There are no kids. These are all adult people that are doing the hokey pokey. And it's like, all right, well, 
You're not really listening to this show if you're doing the hokey pokey. You probably don't want to hear that George W. Bush, <laughs> George H. W. Bush might have had a hand at killing Kennedy or at least knew who did. You don't want to hear about satanic pedophile cults and you don't want to hear about the Russian mob. You don't want to hear about the deep state, the underworld, the overworld. I get it. It's fine. It's fine with me. You don't want to hear about uh, the Craigslist sex stories. You don't want to hear about the morgue and dead hookers, Ray Comp finding things in the cavities of people's bodies. Fine. There's got to be a happy medium between that and the fucking hokey pokey. And then my dad is a musician. My dad uh, sits down. He starts to play guitar. And here's the thing with my dad. I love my dad. My dad is very talented. He's a great guitar player, and he hasn't done it in a while, and he can still play guitar. But the songs he's writing are not good anymore. He's, they're not good songs anymore because he's out of practice, okay? And he's just writing about the shit he does every day. He's a wine salesman. He sells wine. So all of the fucking songs are like, I took the train today to sell a little wine. I go into the city and I go and I sell red wine. Sometimes it's white wine. And I'm like, you know, you're really describing your day with three chords of music. This is not, they're just not deep songs because he's he's checked out he's at an age where he's got his wife he's got his three dogs who he loves and they're all named maya is named after maya angelou ruth is named after ruth Bader ginsburg and fred is named after frederick douglas swear to god i don't know why they're so these politically charged names or whatever but his wife's a big liberal and the kids are big liberal the grandparents are huge liberals so this is they're into this shit and he tells people about the names, the history of the names of the dogs. No one cares. He did it at my grandmother's funeral. It was wildly inappropriate. People were crying. He's showing the pictures going, Fred is named after Frederick Douglass. It was like, hey, cool it. Rain it in. Rain it in. But he, he starts singing these songs and he's like, I take a newspaper ride on the train with coffee that I drink to sell the wine. What? And I'm sitting there, everyone's like, this is fucking great. He's like, I want to move down south because it's summertime everywhere. I'm like, God, writing songs is so fucking easy. I was sitting there going, man, if I did that shit, writing songs is so goddamn easy and pointless. In the summer, it is hot, but in the winter, it is not. And if you have an acoustic guitar behind it, people are like, oh, yeah, this is great. He's an artist. He's an artist. And all these other idiots in the room are like, this is deep. This is deep shit. This is good. And then my uncle's girlfriend's son, who's 47, I don't know how old she is, 100. She looks great. But her son, I figured your son's coming. He's 47. I'm like, he, oh, he's elderly. Your elderly son is coming. So he walks in. He's also a guitarist. So he starts to play. And I swear to God, he goes, I was spending time with my friend and she has an 11-year-old son. And me, and me and the 11-year-old started to write a song together. So then he goes and plays the song that an 11-year-old wrote. I swear to God. And he's like, and it's all based on the colors. He's like, rainbow shine, blue, what are you going to do? Green green, green, whatever, and yellow, you're so mellow. And I'm like, are you fucking that kid? Because that's a bad song. How are you How are you a 47-year-old man? You're going to play a song an 11-year-old wrote? And he's like, he's like, children, it's just so beautiful, you know, where their minds go. And, and I'm like, what? Children are idiots. They're stupid. And their thoughts are worthless, okay, for the most part. Okay, I know sometimes like a child's like they're they have that childlike wonder and they're like they're nice and they're like oh they're like let's not you know they're not, they don't know what genocide is yet and they're not on you know they don't live stream from some bunker and there's lots of benefits to them, but I don't want to hear a song written by children. It's stupid. But my father's songs weren't all that much better. I'm on the train with coffee. It's the morning. Later on, it'll be the afternoon. So. I'm watching these two people sing 
these, with all due respect, retarded songs, literally retarded songs, Blue, what are you going to do? And we're all in the den, and they're playing these guitars. Red, what do you say when it's red? Violet, it's like, what? And and I just, I'm checking out. I'm just really, and I said to myself, I said, this is great. I'm enjoying this. It's lovely. And I'm not, but I'm saying this is nice because this is the end. This is the final Christmas, the last Christmas. I wish everyone well. And next Christmas, I don't know what I'll do. I don't know where I'm going. But it is not, there's no more sing-along, hokey-pokey shit going on. We're done. No more supermarket pie. No more, so what made you want to be a teacher? I've never met a teacher before. Is it the benefits and the exorbitant amount of money? Is that it? Is it the time you have off? Is it the relatively short day? Is it the commute from your home? Ah, is it the fact that you get to boss people around all the time that aren't of age? Well, you know what, folks? I don't want to sound bitter. They did get me, uh, they did get me slippers. I did get slippers. All right, we are here uh, in the in the uh, kitchen of Salvocano, <laughs> who just got me uh, four slices of cheesecake. This is, you know, when you have friends like this, it's like, you know, it's very easy to stay on the straight and narrow and stay uh, in a good place food wise uh, when you have people like this in your life that really uh, treat you well. Um, this is. It's the cheesecake is the best cheesecake, I think, in New York. You know, I'm so glad that you say that because yeah. I respect your opinion. We've yeah. gone out to eat a bunch. Yeah. We talk food a bunch. Yeah. I also just see your Instagram and yeah. whatnot. I look to you as an authority. I yeah. do. And I and and I sh- see I share a love, but you have way more education on food than well, I do. Well, my family's in the business to an extent, right? I mean, my uncle is. And right. we grew up around really good restaurants. And I, I really, it's the one other business that I would consider getting into. Like, I love comedy. I love being a comedian. But if I succeeded on the level of you, you know, or, you know, in that orbit, would it be something I played around with the idea of like opening a small restaurant? Really? You would? Yeah. You know, I was talking the other night, we went out to dinner, it was me and Andrew Schultz and Giannis and Chris, and I'm like, I'm coming to everybody in five years for investors in a restaurant. They all loved it, because we all, you know, we all like eating and going, but- I'm mm-hmm. investing in one now for my childhood friends. Yeah, it's 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 a thing like, I've just observed the business for so long, and I have a great asset in my uncle, a great resource, Sure, that I I, I feel like I would, you know, listen, everything's a risk, but I think- with the amount of with the right amount of money, it would be a, a calculated risk. So I would like a million dollars before I leave. <laughs> you know, I have a menu on my phone that I will show you. No, but this cheesecake is from Pepolino's. Yeah, which I stumbled upon. It's I mean, everybody says juniors. I like juniors. S and S in the Bronx is great. Blah blah blah. But this place is the lightest cheesecake on the planet. Let, let's not get it. Tw- I mean, I've had. P- I've had plenty of amazing cheesecake. Right. Some that have blown my balls off. Right. So, but, you know, when I give this cheesecake to you and you confirm uh, what I feel, it means the world. Because sometimes, if you can believe it, yeah, I've given this cheesecake to people who are like, it's really good. I don't know if it's the best I've had. Well, you know what it is? My friend, I sent my friend and his uh, girlfriend to Don Angie, which is in the a West a restaurant in the West Village the other day. One of the most interesting Italian restaurants, really good food you know, phenomenal food. And, you know, they, they were basically like, ah, oh, it's okay. And it's like, but you, you don't know the difference. What are you looking for? Yeah. What are you looking for? Cause you need you a simple dish. Yeah. A simple dish. Right. People could look at a simple dish and be like, oh, it's just, you know, right. it's just rigatoni with a little bit of red sauce. Right. It's like, no, no, you under, you have to understand yeah. something. There's distinguishments between those things. Yeah. This is made perfectly. It's really, it's, it's the line from, I think it was, you know, I forget, maybe it was the birdcage where it was just like, you know, most people are animals. It's like, <laughs> you, if you can't appreciate <laughs> something, don't pretend like, I don't know a lot about fashion. I know very little about fashion, sure. right? So I don't walk around 
Madison Avenue and tell people what's what. Right. I don't tell people what's, is that jacket worth 10 grand? Maybe it is. To me, it's not. To you, it's not. But I don't know. So if it's worth it to you and that's how you want to spend your money, go do it. But I don't tell people their value system is wrong, you know? Sure, sure. Because I don't know about it. I don't know what lambskin leather is. Right. I'm sure it's great. It sounds nice. And fashion is a lot like art where it is wholly subjective and questionable. Yeah. And it's person to person and there's no right or wrong. Right. Food, food, your body tells you. Yes. Is 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 excellent. It's, Food, it's I think it's more like sports. It doesn't lie. Yeah, I think yeah. it's more like sports because a- athleticism to me is about consistency. Mm-hmm. Like somebody that can do something over and over again better than everybody else. Right. To me, that is 100% like what you look for in a restaurant. Like they're hitting the mark more often than not all the time. That doesn't mean every single meal, right. but it means- Or maybe every dish on the menu. Yeah. That's why I'll never write someplace, off. well, I'll write a place off if everything's terrible, right. the service and the food. You could tell right away. Yeah. You go, oh shit, this is, yeah. I, I got myself into shit here. Yeah. But if something like, you know, some, sometimes a, one dish, that's why I always ask, a lot of times I'll, I'll, I'll ask the waiter, is there a dish on this menu that you think is prepared in a more unique way or right. a way that like that you think is, is special right. and I need to try. I'll always defer to them. I, I, Hopefully I, they say what I wanted. Yes. Because then if they don't, it's a little bit of a conflict. Then it's a, then it's a tug of war. I've always asked a waiter. I love when I, sometimes you go to a place and they're very honest, like Long Island, for example, they are brutally honest. And a lot of the waitresses at diners and stuff are older <laughs> and they just don't care anymore oh, about yeah. anything. And you'll say, is there something here you like? And they go, I don't need anything here. <laughs> yeah. You know, they just have that gritty voice of somebody. Yes. She's like, I wouldn't need anything here. You're like, okay, well, you know, mm-hmm. I think, are you a guy that grew up eating good stuff? Um, or is it something you came to kind of no, later on? I didn't, not in, I, don't, I wouldn't say I grew up in any type of, I didn't have a palate for anything like that. Yeah. Um, no. Not at all. Just just homemade stuff, maybe. Yeah. Which I mean, is, my grand yeah. my grandma cooked really well. Uh, my grandpa and yeah. um and my 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 stepmom cooks really well. Do you cook? No. Yeah. I don't. Right. My You're lady, busy. my lady's a great cook. Yeah. Um, phenomenal. I had Super Bowl party food that was yeah beyond belief. But I don't actually, and I lived a, alone for like a cool decade, and I was the guy that did complete basics, or I just bought my food. Now that the show Prepared. is so big, it's massive now. It's yeah. worldwide. You guys are on stadium tours, arena tours, things like that. Do you ever look back at, the, like, what do you miss the most that you're just not able to do now? Because I've gone out with you and it's amazing to me. I know how successful you are, but it's so, when you go out with, I mean, we've gone to Broadway shows where the entire theater turns around and looks at you mm. when you walk in the it's theater, a, you know, and, if, and I like it because I, I pretend to look at me too. <laughs> I like that. I, I, I kind of do a wave and I, I pose, mm-hmm. but you, you are really just a magnet for people. And you say people come up to you on the street, they'll just start recording you. Yeah, blessing and a curse. Right. You know, first of all, when I, on places like that, it doesn't always happen, but I live, I, I, the other guys are more open to it than I. Right. Especially Joe and James on the show. Right. Which I envy. Right. Uh, you know, James actively welcomes it. Yeah. And I think that that's probably better than what I do. Right. And it's not that I don't appreciate it or welcome it or anything like that. It's just that I'm by nature a very much more private person. I always have been. Right. I'd prefer not to be noticed. Yeah. Um, and especially if I, you know, there's days that we're humans and we don't, yeah, you we don't, don't want to be talk south to anyone. that everybody yeah. knows. Um, so yeah. like I, I find I have to do a low hat and a hood and things like that a lot. It, it helps a little bit, even if it def- deters 50% or whatever. Right. But you get to, I have to, constantly remind myself I hey, just fucking relax because yeah uh what you don't realize it starts festering and i and i end up getting social anxiety yeah because i i feel like people the wor- look, let me tell you and just me. from the other side it is much worse to not have to disguise yourself and not be noticed <laughs> that is much worse no, i know I, several people in that position me being one of them and it is it is far preferable to be like how do i, I don't- sneak into this <laughs> restaurant instead of being like well i could just walk to this restaurant <laughs> naked and no one will care at no, all it's a- it's just that you know it is. It is just what it is. It's just yeah. like I, and I and I'm. I never turn down a kid. I'm. I'm open to talking to anyone at any time. Right. It's just that if I'm with, if I'm on, like if I'm with my you know significant other or with children or my grandma or things like that. Yeah. Or in the middle of 
chewing at a restaurant. Yeah. Just, just certain times it's, it's like, eesh, I wish this wouldn't happen. Yeah. Uh, other than that, open to whatever. And also, especially when people are very respectful. Yeah. But yeah, most of them, you know, a lot of times they'll, they'll just turn on the camera, which is just a weird fucking thing. Yeah. It's, it's a weird thing. Something is broke in somebody's mind yeah. if they don't know that it's I'm not even. I'm not even, I'm fucking basic cable successful. You yeah. know, I'm, you know, making my way in comedy. You know, I don't get me wrong. I, I, I would never change anything for the world. And I, I, I'm more successful than I ever thought I was. I can't even imagine what real, real celebrities and real successful people right. and real like who are, who stars. do you consider real celebrities? Oh, I mean, the people that are, are globally famous for decades like, and decades. What would you say? Like, who? I don't know. Tom Hanks. Yeah. Will okay. Smith. I don't know these people, you know, these people, Beyonce or yeah. Kim Kardashian. I don't know. Yeah. These people, uh, they, well, then again, here's the thing though. They, their success, their wealth, I think, matches their success yeah. in a way that they can set up an infrastructure to navigate something like that. It's hard to be able to run up to Beyonce with an iPhone. It I is, would think. It is. Right? And what's the weirdest phenomenon I learned is, is now it's a little different, but when we first got on TV, people just equate television with, and any type of fame with complete wealth. Yeah, right. Well, I was making- a, a, People think a, I make millions of dollars. Yes. I live in a box. <laughs> yeah. I made a very modest, if not low wage right. for the first few years of course so like i'm you know i'm the same as having a decent regular job and everyone just thinks you know and then and, and but then the, the show is getting popular to a place where they play it so much that everyone kind of knows me but then my my i don't have the infrastructure to shield myself from anything like that so i'm just out there man how does this idea of becoming a comedian happen in your life like how does this start wanted to be a comedian since i'm a child oh wow okay. don't know why or how I, I did some school stuff on stage got some laughs i was a class clown but not like disrespectful just fucking the the guy that i, I made everyone laugh right and that was like through grammar school and high school at least i feel <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah um i don't know and i just i always wanted to i just i idolized eddie murphy and bill cosby as a kid right um and how do you link up with the jokers eventually do you so, start on your own and then meet yeah them? so yeah sure so I, I started doing improv at first yeah i was too nervous to do stand up i right. actually like 20 years ago maybe even more i did like Stand up writing classes because I was so desperate to 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 want to be one, but I was too nervous to get up and I didn't know anyone and I didn't know how to get my foot in the door. So what is so a I did stand that up Gotham, writing Gotham class. Writers okay. Workshop? Yeah. And I went and it was like a stand up comic teaching a class and he'd give writing assignments and we'd come in, read them, share them, critique them, come back, refine them. And I think like after like eight weeks or twelve weeks or whatever it was, you'd have a, a class show. Do you know what's funny? There are people in that that took that class with you that bring it up. They're that, like, I took that class with Sal. There's no way they remember who. You don't think so? No way in the world. Wow. Although I will tell you, yeah. I remember the teacher and I remember, no joke, I remember like at least by face, if not name, almost the whole like dozen people in that class. And, and only it, one person I thought was really, could have been a comic. Everyone else was, because it, it's a mixture. It's, of it's, course. It's like, oh, I want to be better at public speaking. Yeah. Oh, I want to be better at parties. It's like, you know, fuck you. I'm trying right, to, right, you know what yeah. I mean? But it was, I, I, oh, me and my friends still talk about it. There was this old German couple, yeah. okay? I could find their names because I kept the class contact sheet because I'm a hoarder and I keep shit like that. Right. I have it to this day. That's amazing. And we'd come in and, you know, this is, we were writing on you legal pads. You should call pants. all of those people and I tell them <laughs> how much more successful you are than that. But you should just call them and go, hey, we took a class 20 years ago at Gotham. I don't know if you remember me. Here's what what I have you do. guys been up to? Here's what I want to do. Yeah. I'm going to find, I know I have the sheet because, yeah. because recently the Staten Island Museum did an exhibit on us from, yeah. from high school to now. And it was there for like eight months. And I dug through all this stuff to give them all these, like they put them in like the, you know, like, oh, here's the, right. the email where we decided what the name of the group was and right. all this shit. And I found that is i know i have it next time i do your next time i do your podcast yeah. i'll bring it we'll go through the list amazing we will call them amazing i i would love that it'd be it would be fascinating so you take that writing class we're talking 2000 yeah around uh, there it was, no, it was 98 98 I, I was in college Wild. i was coming out of college and going to i had a finance degree i was going to go work at prudential securities and i knew that that little wasn't really what i look you start college at 17 they're like what do you want to do and i'm just like i have no clue what what is, nobody knows well, how do you make money i'm like this was my literal reasoning at 17 don't know what i want to do no i want to make money finance means money right so I'll do finance. Didn't know any, I didn't know what it meant. Didn't know what I was doing. Right. Picked it. Graduated with that degree. Yeah. Mind you, hated it. 
skirt skated through college, got good grades because I, I knew how to do school. Yeah. But I only retain things I was interested in. I have no knowledge of finance. I came out of the school. I started working at Prudential Securities with a finance degree. And then I started going to these classes. And I started going to acting classes at HB Studios just because I needed to know that I was also doing that. You needed to have that that thing that you were passionate about. Yeah. You have some role in your life. You know what's funny too? Oh, we should do this. Okay. Yeah. I also, I think I believe that we used to write and we used to, have to make photocopies of the material back to Gotham. Yeah. And bring in, if there was 12 kids in the class, you would write your stuff and photo copy it and then give out your work to the other 12 people. So when you read it, everyone could read it out loud and critique. Wow. So we hand wrote. So I believe too that I saved other students material. Wow. And the old German couple, they were no joke. I think they were about 70. They were like native New Yorkers. I right? love this. And they just were like a cute, fun loving couple that was still kind of in love, I guess, but they had thick accents and they thought they were way they were pretty fucking cool. Now, they're 70 and going to a Gotham workshop class together. But they also had an air of arrogance about them. Yeah. And they were beyond criticism in the class, which was fascinating. Right. She thought, especially the woman, the guy was like was like very like sophomoric in, in an endearing way. None of the material. I mean, this was hogwash material. Yeah. Picture just handing a pencil and paper to a child and saying, of write course, jokes. Of course. And she, I remember she came in and she was so proud one day and she's like, I have like this whole bit on dieting. Yeah. And she, she went to go and he's like, all right, why don't you go ahead? And I forget her name. And she goes, okay. And she like, everyone, she passed out her papers and she looks down and she was brimming with anticipation, like smirking, like, wait till you hear what I'm about to drop on you. I remember yeah. this. An old, a 75 year old German. Right. She thought she, she goes, had it. Ready? Figured. She looks up, she goes, and people cannot see my face, but you see what I'm, right. she was like, wait, you're not ready for me. Right. And then she said, dieting is not easy. You, you gain, uh, you, you lose two pounds, you eat a slice of tomato, you gain three. <laughs> <laughs> and then she leaned back and waited, licked her eruption. lips and was just like, Ado ad adorn me yeah. with cheers. Yeah. It was amazing. And then, uh, you know, we were like, okay, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, you know, uh, okay, you know, can you expound on yeah. it? She's like, oh, what? I read you the joke. Yeah, I've made the I, perfect I read you. joke. She, that was that was the joke. Yeah. That she wrote that week. Yeah. Yeah. That's so crazy. Yeah. But you know, you get a glimpse in a classroom like that. What's very interesting is you get a glimpse into, I think, the delusion that you need. You need a yeah, little bit I of delusion. I agree wholeheartedly. Right? You need a little bit of delusion to push you through, especially the beginning. The beginning of comedy is brutal. And most people don't understand how brutal because they haven't done it's it. It's like you are, you're literally in a, in a pitch black room and you don't know what you're doing. You don't know how, you, you don't know where to go, where to, what to say, who to turn, what's good, what's not good. Right. There's something in your head you think is good is, by the way, my stuff was shit. Right. I mean, I, 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 I remember I, one of the, I just remember one of my topics I was engaging in how like re religious people um, are hypocrites. <laughs> right. I mean, mind you, I, I was raised Catholic. I, I went to Catholic right. school from, from kindergarten to senior of college. Right. I'm not, I mean, I'm not, I'm not religious, but right. I was like, not, 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 uh, what did I say? They were doubled. It, my bit was how they, you're in church and you give this peace be with you. And then two minutes later, they're all flipping each other off, cutting each other off in the parking lot when they're leaving. Or right. And, and so on and so on. It wasn't good. Right. But I, at least it was just touching upon something that I knew about or whatever. It wasn't, yeah. you gain, uh, do you lose two pounds? You have a tomato. You gain three. Gain three. No. Yeah, that you you weren't there. That's a that's mic drop. But like. in the beginning, most people I think are you know when you tell anybody that you're doing comedy, you're going to be a comedian. There are people that think you're funny that are supportive, but the idea that you would make a living at it or you'd make a career of it, people are just like, okay, buddy, you know? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, nor did I know if I would make a career. Right. I loved it. Yeah. And my goal at that point yet wasn't yet a career. Right. It was like. Cause, cause you know, honestly, a career feels pretty grand, right? Unless you're sacrificing everything, yes. Uh, and you know that I'm on a couch and I'm poor and I'm not doing anything but this, and that's your goal. But I didn't commit that far yet. I and, had a full time and that's job. Really, that's what it's about, I think. Because we tell everybody 
in our culture right now that you can be whatever you want to be. You can follow your dreams. These are all good and positive things to tell people, but we don't tell anybody about the word sacrifice. We don't, that is, that is, it's it been eliminated and there's something I mean, uh, very dishonest. And it's sacrifice everything. Everything. It's not, it's not some things. Correct. It's sacrifice quality of life. Yes. Sacrifice sleep and health. Yes. Sacrifice personal relationships. Correct. Sacrifice dignity. Correct. Sacrifice your I just own, got, your own I just got sleep back. Yeah. I still have the right. I still have, I still have quality of life. I'm waiting for dignity back. We'll be thinking <laughs> a year or two. I just got where I can sleep a little better, but yeah. nothing. But yeah, no, it is. And by the by, right. I still feel those things now, even with success. Sure. So. <laughs> I mean, that's what I think people don't understand is that you, it really is everything. Yeah. And when did you know that you were going to make that sacrifice? At yeah. what point did that happen? Yeah. So the guys and I, we did improv and, and you meet in high each school. other. We did. We met in high school. It's okay, thirteen wow. so you years guys old. Are just that—that that is what makes the show so great. You guys have known each other thirty years this year. Wow. We met with the same exact age, all born in '76. We met as freshmen in the same exact school, 1990. Yeah. And uh, and we by the end of it, we weren't even like a clique or anything, but we just we were all friendly. We had, went to a small school, so everyone right. knew each other. We did improv in high school. We left. We all went separate ways. Uh, I continued, like I said, I did. I tried to do stand up. I took some acting classes, and then when we all got back from college in '98, we all were kind of still doing it a little bit. So that what's interesting is that you all went to college, and then at, after college, it, you guys like you were like let's I ran get, into someone on, on, yeah. at the mall. Let's get the band I, back together. People I ran into still, James at the mall. Wow! And he said, "I started." I, he's like, "I started an improv troupe at Georgetown. They didn't have one." And actually, James James went to Georgetown with. Uh, he did improv there with Berbiglia, Kroll, uh, and then when he left, Mulaney came in. But all those guys were- yeah, Jack Novak was a yeah, show now. Yeah, yeah. oh yeah, yeah. The, yeah. Like George Town just put out the funniest, most successful. Those guys like Mulaney, I mean, come on, Jesus. Right, Mulaney, of Mulaney, course. Berbiglia, God. Uh, even Kroll, those guys, I, I, I admire those well, guys. Well, it's a story of, you know, so, those so guys, much. it's just a story of how far you can go coming from poverty. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? It's just, it's so impressive to see- very poor, <laughs> underprivileged people figure it out. Like that's the American so that, dream. I'm, yeah. I love everyone, but yes. the Ivy League schools really put out quality. <laughs> <Ivy Leagues. laughs> yeah, no, but those guys are really though, it's so funny though because I, 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 I literally, lo I they're brilliant. I mean, Mulaney, they're even brilliant. the bigs, they're brilliant. They're so, brilliant. Um, but yeah, so he came out of that little crop, and uh, and uh, anyway, he was like. I, he's like, you want to try and do like improv and stuff? And right. I was like, yeah. I was like, let's call Joe. And then we called our buddy Mike Q, Brian Quinn who on the show. He um, was peripherally around. He was writing and working for Kevin Smith, actually, okay. I think, and doing like comic books. And he was writing movies and stuff. He was He's very talented and he was always inclined that way. And he would join us at shows and like be a guest on shows. But first it was our buddy, Mike. And you guys were the tenderloins. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. And so our buddy, Mike, now he kind of left a long time ago, started a family is very successful in his own right and went a different way. And then somewhere in the middle, Q decided to join us. And then after that was when we got like, uh, was when MySpace and YouTube started. And that's when we transferred all of the stage stuff. We, we moved on to sketch comedy. Right. And then, and then we moved on to filming those sketches and putting them online. So somebody at YouTube and somebody at MySpace saw saw them would put them on the homepage and sometimes they get hundreds of thousands of views in a couple of hours. And what had happened was, and I've told this story before, so I apologize if people listen and they've heard this stuff, but there was a competition NBC was having to find the best sketch comedy troupe. And it was really their way of finding talent on, they were hosting an online competition. They were going to turn it into a show. Yeah. But instead of interviewing people, they just held a, an online competition for submissions. And every week they gave you a theme and you had to turn over a sketch in a week. And if you won, you could win a thousand dollars. And they did that for like 20 weeks and hundreds of sketch troops from all over the country kept submitting and it was online voting. And out of those 20 weeks, we won like 11 of them. Wow. So we won $11,000 in 20 weeks filming these sketches with a handy cam and the four of us. And they saw And were they, were they similar to what you do in Practical Joker style? No, absolutely not. They were okay. just pure sketch comedy. Gotcha. They still live on YouTube online. Some right. of them hold up. Some of them are embarrassed. Right. When I, it is what it is. You need to crawl before you can walk. Right. I'm not even sure if I'm walking. Of course. And um, we $11,000 was like, literally, we won the Powerball. Yeah. 
And and then what they did was at the end of that run, it was going to be a studio show hosted by Carson Daly on NBC called like the battle of the what have you's. I don't know. And they took the five best videos they thought that they found from that whole thing, which by the way, that was going to be their pilot episode. They got content for $5,000 because five videos. And then they filmed a pilot and the audience voted and we won $100,000. Wow. And this was what year? This was 1997. So this is a big, I was sleeping on a couch. Yeah. And uh, in a little basin apartment and we split it. And I was like, at the tax, it was like 20 grand each. And it was transformative because right. I didn't have to worry about like rent and stuff like that. Right. And then um, the show never aired, but legally they had to pay us. Right. So they paid us. And from that, we got an agent. And then our agent was at a small boutique agency and later went to CAA and we migrated with him. So that's how we got a smaller agent to a bigger agent. And then after that, we started writing and pitching TV shows. How many shows would you say that you pitched before Impractical Jokers was born? Probably 20. 20 shows going into the pitch meeting. How many of them sold? Sold 20. No, 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 no. Uh, yeah. We pitched 20, maybe sold... Uh, Four. So for people that don't understand, you, you go in and pitch a show. When you sell a show, yeah. you, in most cases, not always, but you film a pilot. Yeah, so if you're lucky. Yeah, you Sometimes they could just sort of sure. presentate a shorter version of it. Yeah, you film a, 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 a yeah. pilot episode of the yeah. show. So you did that a few times. We did pilot presentation about four times. Four Everything times. Everything from like, we had a show, a single camera scripted, like almost like It's Always Sunny. Right. That was the first bite we got. Fox and Spike offered to buy it. And we were nervous to go with Fox. Yeah. And we thought we if we went with Spike, it was a much smaller boutique thing aimed at guys. Do you think our age. Fox would just chew you up and spit you out? Fox even offered more money right. to, to shoot it. But what we just the thought hesitancy? well, they're they're gonna they're gonna take a a, a flyer on a hundred shows and maybe pick two or three. Right. Sp Spike might be doing 10, 15 shows and picking two or three. Right. So we went with Spike. It was a learning experience. The the production company that we did it with, um, they were a little green too, I think. And in the end of it, we both learned a lot. It wasn't the best experience. Now, during this process of pitching shows and pilots, there's is everybody 100% in or do you have to grab one of you guys one point and go, no, it's going to work out? There's like, does somebody, <laughs> is it because you had that early success? You you had that 100,000, you you won that contest that there was just this idea that it was going to work? Well, we all because still four had, people. We all still had full-time jobs. So, okay. So nothing's changing. Nothing's changing. Right? We were doing those things. Everything we've ever done has been in addition to our full-time jobs. Right. So now we have people that can get us a meeting. And so right. now, what, now the now the guys and I are sitting down and every day having lunch and being like, "What's an idea? Let's develop another idea." Let's because when we go in these meetings, we don't want one idea; we want five ideas. Right, right. And we go, and sometimes they fail miserably. And um, in that one, we filmed the pilot, a pilot presentation, and they only wanted they gave us like seventy five grand spike, and they wanted like. Five, six minutes. Is Spike TV still around? I have no idea. Sp that was like television for dudes, for yeah. men. And it was like Robot Wars, yeah. right? Isn't yeah. that the type yeah. of stuff I, they had? Yeah. yeah, as I recall, it was. And it was like, yeah. it had its little niche. Right. And we thought maybe we we could succeed there. You know, like, so So we made it. But the, the production company that we made, made it with decided we're going to give them the full 30 minutes. Right. Because we want them to see that we could produce this amount of material in this amount of time for this amount of money. Right. The fact is we couldn't do any of that. Right. We spread ourselves thin. We had a loss in quality. We had to put in extra money of our own because it didn't, because we went through their money. Right. It took longer to deliver and we didn't give them what they asked for. Right. We didn't know any better. We just deferred to them. Right. Now we know. So we were so soured with that experience that we left and we said, we can do this better, a newer idea better by ourselves with no one else for less money. We called in all favors from friends that we've been making the videos with over the years and friends that were comics and had talent. We put together a volunteer crew. We chipped in our own money. And for $5,000, we made another pilot out there on our own. And it got into all these festivals. So that's the lesson is to do it yourself. Do it yourself. That's the lesson. The lesson is if you can do it yourself, do it yourself. If you can, call in every favor and do, and you learn more. Right. Because I learned 
I learned from the first one, but you learn more when you're making the mistakes yourself too. And we made mistakes too. And it didn't, and ultimately that didn't really get picked up either. We almost got to deal with YouTube at the time, but that didn't get picked up. And then we had a couple of game shows that we shot about. They didn't get picked up. And, and but nobody in the four of you, which is interesting, goes, fuck this. We're done. Nobody. Everybody. No, because it was exciting. Because yeah. we, we went, we you're went closer. Every no is closer. We went to a 10 yes. years without an agent. Now right. we have one. He's telling us, give us ideas. Right. So we were young. I mean, not, we weren't young, but it was, right. Right. It was, we were 30 or whatever. No, actually, no. So, so sorry. When we first started improv, we were 22, 23. Right. But by the time this rolled around, we were 30. Right. 31. Yeah. And we were like, uh, but we still felt young. I mean, we, we right, were young. Of course. We had no accomplishments. Right. And, and you know, that is still young, actually. It is young. And you didn't mind living on the couch and you didn't mind no. kind of working the day job and then putting I it was in. getting a little nervous. I didn't have health insurance. Right. I was bartending. I was making really good money bartending. Yeah. I got into a neighborhood spot and I really like was good at my job. I enjoyed it. And so I was making money to save and pay all my bills. So I felt good, but it was off the books with no health insurance. I knew sooner or later something was going to give. I mean, I had a finance degree. I knew I could always go back because I left Prudential and they told me that if I wanted to come back, I could. Right. And, um, and I always knew I can go back. Back. And then just as luck would have it, um, after, after we kept failing, we said, what can be an idea where we don't have to try to learn how to do that idea? And it's like, well, that would just be being ourself. So what's an idea where we could just be ourself and then things will hopefully fall into place. And we said, well, if we just improvise and fuck with each other and play each other, then what do we really have to learn? Then we just got to figure out how to edit it funny and know, trust what we think is funny. And that's it. We don't have to know camera angles and story structure and pacing and how to act better than we did. Cause we didn't really know how to act. Right. So now let's not act. Let's just be ourselves. And then that idea went to true. We went, we, we, okay. So we had, they set us up with a round of pitch meetings before we had any ideas. Okay. We had the meetings with true and the rest of things scheduled. No idea yet. It was a week away. And we sat down, thought of it at a lunch. We thought of a few ideas. That was one of them. And we had the meeting booked before the idea. Is the name something you guys came up with? No, I hate the name. Okay. Interesting. I, I, the name has now grown on me. The I, name is great. I think it, I thought it was the word. I was, her, I was mortified by the name they, they yeah. put it on us. We, we went to it and we, we were going to call it uh, Mission Uncomfortable. Okay. Uh, because the original conceit was, and we tweaked it a little bit, was that we drove around in this van and we pull up outside locations and then people, viewers, would send in these missions for us to do and we'd go in and compete and see who could do them better. And the van was like Kit and it was going to be voiced by Patrick Stewart and he had, and he didn't like us and he was like an extra character. It was like, it, it went to yeah. alliterations. But right. then, then we said, we, we got the, we said, now fuck the van, you know, f and, and, and fuck submissions. Let's write these things ourselves. Right. So we tweaked it a bit. But, um, what was, what was your, wait, where were we going? I was this? saying the, the, the name. Yeah. So that's why it was called Mission Uncomfortable. We thought it fit well. But I will tell you, a blessing was that they named the show what we, it was, it's now it's eponymous. It, it's basically now what we're called as the name of the show, which is really good to have your identity tied to the brand, the yes, name, because that the helps jokers. the brand. But when they came back, they were going to call us Daredevils. And I said, I will literally not do the show. Right. I, 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 it's, and then they said Impractical Jokers. And I said, people are going to start calling us the Jokers. Right. I was like, guys, I'm a 30 something year old man. I'm trying to take my comedy seriously. Like, right. And who says the word impractical? Right. It's a mouthful. It's an odd word. Right. Uh, that people aren't going to latch on to. Also, it's corny. Yeah. A practical joke. We're going to do an impractical one. Yeah. And I had a feeling in my gut because all my peers in comedy, because I used to um, run this bar and I was in comedy already and I hosted a comedy show every Tuesday night with J.F. Harris, my buddy. Oh, wow. He would host, it was called Grab Ass. It lasted like three or four years. What year was that? Well, yeah. 2008, uh, okay. 8, 9, 10, 11. Okay. And every comic that you know right now in the city, everyone from Michael Che to, to every person we know has done that show. And right. I, I knew them all already as the bartender manager of this bar that was also in comedy before I got it. So all my peers, I was like, they're going to hear I got a show and it's going to be called Impractical Jokers. And right. I was like, this is just demeaning. It's Isn't it so funny how that's you? It's the first reaction you have is the, that it's going to be a demeaning. Hugh has a video. It's so funny. She has a video of them telling me 
he turned the video on and they told me on, on the video that the network is insisting it's this and that's what it has to be. And I had a visceral nausea. I literally yeah. lost the blood in my face. I went, I turned like a white green Yeah. and I literally like was close to dry heaving. He has it on. We cry laughing when he told me. It's the most successful prank show in history. Candid camera. Okay. It's, it's getting close though. It, I, I mean, I appreciate that. It's getting close. I Candid camera. That. Historically, you have an argument there, but I mean, it, it just, it, We're it's, not, well, we don't exist without them, but we try sure. to take multiple genres. And who put was it the guy? Who's the candy camera guy? Alan Funt. Alan Funt. Correct. Yeah. But it was different. It was different, but that's the impetus of everything that came after it. Yes. That's a great point. But we, um, we, we, we don't even like, we don't even call it a prank show. Like we don't, we don't, I mean, right. look, you get written up and we get discussed and is it? Yes, it is yeah. in, in an element of it. But when we're making it, we didn't want to fall into that trap. I feel like sometimes you paint yourself. We didn't want to paint ourselves into being the pranksters. And unfortunately right. a byproduct of this is that a lot of times we are. And a lot of times people don't know the show and don't know us. And I meet them. I see the judgment because I think that they don't know what we're about. They haven't given the show a chance. They don't know what I've done outside of it. I've been in the comedy world. I've, right. I've made a dozen shows. I've I've written and contributed to a lot of things. I'm a stand up. I'm right. I do a lot of stuff in comedy. But I I I I see even sometimes when we'll do like talk shows. Right. Yeah. So you guys are the uh, the pranksters, you know. Right. And it's like, look, I'm a I'm a middle aged man. Yeah, but also, I, 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 what I'm is, not. I'm yeah. not like a YouTube kid turning on my thing, slapping somebody in the back of the head, and running. Like they right. just, they, they. I feel like it is. Um, it's reductive. Like it, it's, it's just. It's, you sure, know. but I think it, it, when you do it, it really well, it's an art form. I mean, it's great. I appreciate that. Yeah. And that, that is what the goal, you know. Yeah, but, but but I thought that the name Impractical Jokers would would you know perpetuate that right brand you as that and, and 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 but now something happened where it just is what it is, and people oversee the name are you and 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 honestly it was a blessing because yeah. if we were called we wouldn't be called the mission uncomfortables no of course you know, like so call me a joker go ahead people people don't do it anymore with like a that's corny as fuck they just do it like it is what it is they're the joke what is the advice for people out there that are trying to get something off the ground that haven't been able to get it off the ground what i mean the, the it seems you know the trial and error part of it seems to be so essential. Like there's, I think I know certain people where I go, you're not failing enough. And it sounds wild, no. but I feel like you're not failing enough. I have failed at so many things. I I'm still failing at that. I still throw things out and I go, that wasn't what I wanted it to be. No, well, you know, just fail up, fail up. That's the whole move because there's people yeah. out there that are afraid to try. And they're even in the business of comedy. They've, 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 you know, pushed off the doctor. I'm swimming still afraid. After. Yeah. I'm we still, are. right? And if you're not, you're doing it wrong. Right. I, I'm afraid. I see comedians. I see young kids. I see open micers with more confidence than I know that I have. I, I don't say I have well, no- that, by, by the way, that's an issue for them. It is. <laughs> it is. And I'm not that's saying- Because I'm sitting in your home and they shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying that I don't have confidence, but I'm saying I doubt myself routinely. I'm nervous routinely. I question if I'm good enough routinely. Sometimes I feel good. Sometimes I feel bad. Sometimes I feel like I belong. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I feel like I earned and deserve what I have. Sometimes I feel like no one really should earn or deserve that much for it. I don't, I don't right. know. I, I flip flop all the time, but I'll be still in a room and be like, especially I'm trying new stuff or if there's someone around that I really respect, you know, but I see some of these people walk into a room and God bless them. Because they don't have anything to back it up per se. And right. I don't mean their material. Maybe their material sucks. Maybe it's okay. Maybe it's really good, but they're still young and they don't have a body or uh, they don't have enough body experience work. to yeah. back up the feeling. But right. maybe that's where I'm wrong because maybe they are not mutually exclusive. Right. You, if you're that person that walks around like that every day and that's who you are, then that's who you you got to get out. I think sometimes that can be an asset. Sometimes it can be, a, it can really hinder somebody. Yeah. Because the reality is, those types of people go very far or nowhere. I've tend, yeah. tend to feel, you know, because that, and I've seen that. Some of that is genuine. Some of that confidence, and some of it's just being a sociopath and being like, sure. I don't care how I'm doing. I'm a star. And here's the thing. If that's the way you present yourself and you position yourself like that, sometimes it works and people go, oh, you're a star. So if, you're, I was just about to say, sometimes yeah. it's a fake until you make it type thing. Yeah. You, you, if you're that enough, people are going to be like, oh, he's that. Right. And then again, just keep, you could be that, keep failing up. And then, but I don't sometimes know. It, 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 it doesn't work because what happens is those people 
Don't have those like dark nights of the soul where they go, man, am I a fraud? Am I even good? What am I doing? Because I think those are the nights that make you go, okay, what do I do that's going to be funny now? Like I transitioned to doing a lot more stuff on social media because that was where a lot of prospective fans were. Sure. And, you know, I I was in the development process and something similar to what you described, not nearly as many, but like you go through it a few times and you go, I'm watching my Mm. career sail away because I'm not connecting with people because I'm working with suits and industry people and and they like me and they're coming out to shows and they're going great set and let's make a show and blah, blah, blah. And that's great. But I'm losing this whole chunk of people that I need to buy tickets and really to enjoy what I do because I want to make people laugh. Sure. And they're on Instagram and Twitter and social media and YouTube and that. So I pivoted to that. But again, if I if I maybe was the type of person that was just like, hey, well, I'm getting meetings and people like me and the hell with it. I'm gonna, you know, yeah, you know, I think there was part of it of like sitting in, uh, you know, my producer's garage in Los Angeles going, well, what are we going to do now? Yeah. You know, the pilot is not going to go. Yeah. Uh, the scripted show is not going to go. And we have these tools and maybe we can just, maybe we can be funny and put it out online and see what it. happens. And then these dumb little sketches and things we do, you know, Joe Rogan's playing them for Kevin Hart. Yeah. You know, people are, you know, people like you, people that I respect are going, oh, these are really funny things. Yeah. And then I it, love it. I yeah. love it. I, I, you know, I've championed you from- No, you have since for a very long you. time. I appreciate that. I'll tell that. anybody who will listen. I told yeah. you you should write a book. I appreciate it. Yeah, tweet, it's I tweet of, your it's, shit out all yeah, the time. No, it's, it, the, the book is, is definitely going to- I'd like to do that. That's something I'd like to I've do. I've gone on your bus tours. Yes. I you, a, yeah, a you're Tim a legit diehard. Yeah, we're going to do maybe another one of those in the spring. Um, it's it, it, So it really is about, it's, it's kind of like failing up. Personally now, do you feel you're, you're accomplished, you're successful, you guys have done it? Is it ever, do you ever get anxiety now? Because you're like, well, what now? Oh, make no mistake. I just, I'm a person that lives with anxiety. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I mean, I think that every day. Yeah. I, I, um, you know, even when we got the show, the show could be canceled any moment. Right. We're now luckily about to start season nine. But yeah, at well, the season, I, I, I think now the show's not going to be canceled. But at the season think, one, yeah. we didn't know. At the season right. two, we didn't know. They held that over us. Right. You know, uh, even, not even their choice. What did people stop watching? Also, we got the show and didn't know how to make a show. We right. had the idea. We knew what we wanted to do, but then we also had to learn on while we were doing it how to do yeah. it. Yeah. And now we know how to do it. But if I venture outside of this box, I'm going to have that process all over again. And this show, while bittersweet, will end soon enough. And it'll be a silver lining because I love the show. This is the golden years. I don't know if I'll ever have something that'll be as big a legacy as this to me. But I am ready, willing, and wanting to explore so many other projects and creative outlets. So that will be the saving grace when this golden time of of this show passes. And I get, you know, we, we lose all the staff that we've, become family and other, but I'm just looking at it like all right well also like let me add them because I want to go and do all this other stuff not including stand up because I got right now well you know my stand up is in every free moment that I have right but I want to I want to you know yeah it's a great problem to have but I, I want to you know be online with my peers that are right putting in you know I, I want to be put full capacity yeah yeah. And that's why I won't even do a special until I could do that. So I'm like waiting until this all ends and I could dedicate all my time, only my time just to that and then see if I put, if I can put something out that I, I'm proud of. And if I, and I don't think I can, then I won't. Right. But I, but I'm nervous. I don't know like what I'm going to do after this. And like, you know, I just, I just, does it change know. having does does having money change? Uh, cause there, there are people that talk about this. Does having money change the, you know, the, the sense of urgency or the sense of like, you know, being, being successful. Does that, cause some people go, uh, I lose my motivation. No, no. Well, it's a case to case. I'm sure. Right. And I'll say yes and no, it's gray. Right. I don't, I don't lose motivation. It makes it easier, le- less stressful to know that I don't have to worry that I can't pay my rent or something like that. Right. That peace of mind is an intangible. I mean, it's, you can't even, I mean, it's, that's Yes. That helps, but I have something that I want that I haven't achieved yet. 
And I want to do that because I have a passion for it, not because I'm trying to make money. Yeah. So that hunger for me is there. And that's the type of person you've always been because people that get into this business, even though that they want to make money, that their, their main thing is they want to do something they like. They want to do something that excites them. First of all, anyone getting into comedy or acting or anything because they like think, and it sounds trite to even say this, it sounds like it's obvious, but if you're listening to this and you want to be an actor and actress because you want to be a movie star and you want to be famous and you want to be rich, like- you should not do this. <laughs> You're not going to succeed. Right. Like it has no, this has nothing yeah. to do with it. <laughs> like, I, I, no, I mean, yeah, you, you have no shot. I, I would bet my, I would bet my hard earned money yeah. that you will never be successful. Oh, right. Yeah. Because you have to, you have Can to this be have the clip something from wrong. The episode? With, what? <laughs> yeah. Can this be the clip? I always like to check that this could be the clip. I had to tell you a story. Because when we, this is great. I mean, I yes. Had to, I had to tell you a story when you, when we go offline, I can't tell it online. Of course. That, I wish I could tell online, but I don't, I haven't figured out yet how to tell it where it wouldn't affect people negatively. Of course. But you will do a, a, a tumble sauce if I tell you off, okay. offline. Well, yeah. But anyway, Some things me. in life need to be private. But yeah, but my, my point is, is that like, you can't, you cannot I mean, we go do to, this. We go to shows. One of the things I like is that when we see these, you know, the ferrymen, how talented are those people? Yeah. I took Ben to see that show. Yeah. You know, those people You're a good are, looking guy. are not Do you famous. model? Do you model? You I should. Mean, let's not give him a head. You yeah, know what I mean? God let's bless not give him, him a head. The guy looks he's, like friggin' a young Brad Pitt. He's fine. The reality yeah. is he's and fine. And he's got a fashion sense with those glasses. He's fine. There's no, si there's no six pack. There's nice not, smile. It's not, he's got a, his hair flops to the right. Yeah. Seems like he has a nice it, build. He has a nice five o'clock shadow. It's not, it's not bad. What are you, what are you 25 years old? 27, 27. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't walk around with somebody who's an uggo. Yeah, yeah. You know, he's good. A lot of people say that, that he's good looking, and I think it, it fills his head, but I- I, 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 I get, I'll get you some work. Yeah. Yeah. I want, get me work, Amateur please. stuff, <laughs> internet, but it is what it is. Can no. you get me work? I'm <laughs> singing for my supper here. I make a living with my mind. <laughs> Hold on um, a second, Tim. So, Ben, I- <laughs> So, like, the, the whole thing- is really that these guys you watch them in the ferryman you're like these are great actors and actresses some of them are known most of them are not they're not going to be known yeah. they'll make some money maybe they'll but they're doing it because they love it Guess it's they're different. probably happy they're probably happy yeah yeah and homeless many yeah, of them they probably don't that's have true. homes i can't i i this i promise you this is real sound will sound syrupy a little bit every day Every fucking day, I can't believe my life, and I cannot believe this happened to me, and I'm very thankful every single fucking day. I yeah. wake up, I think about it. I go to bed, I think about it. I don't miss a day. Right. I feel that way. I th I can't believe it. I, I didn't come from money. you know. I came from a good family, but not money, and I get to support my entire family now, and I- that is the yeah. Now you're at a point where you can support members of your family. Yeah, I'm not saying people. like I, I'm not no, saying like course. my family doesn't. But you could just do nice. But I just for mean people. like now I feel my family doesn't have to worry. You asked if I worry about money. I don't worry about like my money for me, but I I do worry about money still because like obviously you I'm. I didn't make money in the beginning, even with the show, and now I'm at a place where I kind of am, right? Yeah. And then when that goes away, I, I will do other projects, and I'm, I'm going to be a comic for the rest of my life, and I'll tour, but I might not... Who knows if the the level will be at the level that I'm at after a nine-year tenure on a project. Right. Right? Who knows? And But so I'm saving, saving, because I know that I just want to have peace of mind that my family won't have to worry, extended family, yeah. will not have to worry about anything... As long as I'm here, and I, the, the, so the, I have anxiety about that. The, the the main reason that I've always wanted to make money is <laughs> is to let my family know that you guys still have to worry. That's the only reason I want to succeed is to let them know that you have to worry, no matter how good I'm doing. It has nothing to do with you, and you know. No, but I I I don't mean to discourage anyone, but it's not a. It's not why you get into something. You don't yeah. get into. You don't get in. That's not why you get into no, the just, arts. It, it stumbles in. It happens. You had to love the art, otherwise it's not gonna. The, the, you know. the lady you date, she's so cool with everything. That's important. Yeah, that yeah. didn't come easy. Yeah, that didn't come easy. It's because right. it's a weird life we live. Yeah, I'm I'm away, I'm working all day and all night. Yeah, all day and all night. Right, and then I'm away. You know, two, three, or four weekends a month. Sometimes I, you know, sometimes I'm not home right. for a month. Right. Sometimes I'm not ho home before you know three a.m. for a week straight. Sometimes right. I, uh, I have one. Not always, but sometimes I have. I'll have one day off in a month. 
Right. You know, like whatever it is. Like, so, so that's an adjustment period. But I think that once you weather it a little bit and then, you know, she was able to see like, this isn't like me partying. This isn't me choosing not to be here. This isn't me doing something social. This is me putting all of my efforts and energy into something I love in order to succeed and to help us. Right. You know, and and once you see that, it's just like, okay. And then, then you get on that team and then she helps me because like, you need us. If you're in a relationship, you need the full support of that person. And I will tell you, Rickles is on my wall right there. I got to meet Rickles um, before he passed. Yeah. And, uh, I talked to him for a while and that was one of the first things I, I met him with my dad and she was there and he's, he sat down and he talked about, cause he he's married till the end. He, he right. was married when he passed to his wife. And he said that that was the most important thing to him was to have someone that was his backbone that understood what he was doing, supported it, didn't question it and only enabled it and helped it, you know, despite all the regular bumps that you have yeah. in the relationship. And, uh, I believe that. I believe that. Cause it's gonna, it's it gotta be hard. Cause you, you don't want any any uh, any barriers to entry of what, for what you're trying to do, and if the person that you that you're involved with isn't getting it, how many people that are pursuing something creative? Let's be honest, their partner's not into it, and they pretend yeah. to be into it. Yeah. Most people are just not into it. I think it's a specifically in a in a place where one person has an unconventional career right you know i'm mean, everyone if you're both doing separate nine to fives or, or you right. hate your job or whatever it is if it's something but when it's something this unconventional the other person has to and then by the way with success comes you know more challenges because like who the hell wants to be like your pictures put up people say mean things about you of course you walk around people yeah have an opinion it's just not a, you just sacrifice privacy that's a right. big thing too yeah and, and and no privacy is tough in for relationship too so there are like these little things that you never really think about but then they present themselves to you you have to navigate them i wouldn't change anything for the world of course but if you want a little insight as to like that kind of feeling yeah there's always a set of challenges what do you love about staten island because i love staten island because i when do you i love it well when i yeah i have a history with staten island when i first started uh, stand-up comedy, I was selling copiers, telemarketing copiers in uh, Tottenville at a place called Reliable Office Systems. And oh, I- That's just the best name ever. Yeah. Reliable Office Systems. We're reliable. That was <laughs> that was it. That was the hook. And I would take a ferry. I was living in Midtown Manhattan with Jay you Harris, were, by the way, you and were, Jesse Dodge. I was living- You were not. I didn't know that. I was living with them you, in- the spare room of their apartment. It was it was Are the second divorce I watched. Me. It was crazy. First one was my parents. Second one was them. I bear responsibility, I think, a little bit for both. <laughs> <laughs> you I, reverse commuted. That's what I reverse commuted, which is and I had a whole joke about it, a whole bit about it where I was like, We're going we're past the Statue of Liberty, but we're going the wrong way. We're going the wrong way. And it was crazy. And I would I would take a train to the Staten Island ferry and then I would get on the ferry, get off the ferry, and by the way, get on the S seventy four bus yeah. to Tottenville, which is another hour. That's the a full com- hour. The commute was a two hour process to get to reliable office systems. I would get up at 6 30. I'd get to my desk by nine. I'd work till one or two. I'd get back into the city by four, four thirty, and then do open mics. And you had to because that's where the work was. That's where I would immediately be like, where can I do this where I am? Well, then they eventually after a few months of that, they moved me to their office on Sixth Avenue and made me like a copier guy. And then I was like, the problem was I was getting dragged into the nine to five world where they were like, oh, you're going to wear suits and you're going to be, this That's is why your I career. a bartender. And then I had to stay. So eventually while I was walking home, I saw one of the tour buses and I went, oh, that seems so free to just stand on that bus and talk and nobody cares. That's what I have to do. I can't be in an office all day because then you start to go out to work dinners and everything and you start to get sucked, uh, sucked into that. into that vortex. Yeah. You saw a bus pass and the light bulb went off. The light bulb went off and I said, I should do that while I want to, while I learn what I need to learn and while I, uh, you know, can't make money at comedy, I shouldn't be in an office. But- the time I was in Staten Island, maybe three months, four months, intense Staten Island. I mean, Staten Island every day, dinner at Angelina's a lot, quarterly dinners, month like- I know you love Angelina. Staten Island Christmas parties. I, I really, for whatever well, you're reason- you're Long Island, right? Yeah, I you're grew up Island. in Long So this Island. is your sister here, your Very cousin. similar. Very similar. It everybody's is. Italian. Everybody's kind of in the mob or yeah, yeah, thinks yeah. they're in the mob. Yeah, yeah. for yeah. sure. Oh, thinks they are, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. It's blue collar. It's, uh, it's, it's more conservative. Right. Um- it's old school. Right. Um, it's it's just like any other place, I like to say, because I know Staten Island, there's a stigma with it and it does get a bad rap. And not 
not for no reason. Because right. stereotypes is this her reason. One of my but jokes this, this is that could you, have been. you know it's a, 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 the worst place in the city because you have to take a boat to get there and it's free. <laughs> that was my joke. I said that's a, it's a thirty minute boat ride. The city's like this is on us. <laughs> it, it was like that's great. Yeah, it, 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 it's it's an interesting. Which, by place. the way, boat rides the best. But Charming as shit. It's free. Great. Get a tall boy, sit outside, see the yeah, statue, we, go yeah, back and forth. It's during awesome. the spring and summer, there's nothing better. Um, I love it here because this is. The, this is what made me who I am. Right. Simple as that. That's what I, I like, I like about who I am. I take, yeah. I take the good with the bad here. I get why people don't like certain things. Um, I just don't like when people um, trash it. Just like I was saying at the top of our conversation, like even about like our show or just like, I don't like when people judge. Right. You know, and I, and, and look, I, I just don't like when people, if people are educated and can trash it, but then also could tell me the good things they like about it. Right. And then give me a well-balanced take on it. That's no problem. hundred percent. But if people are just like, fuck these people, fuck them. Oh, you're from there. Oh, you're automatically this, which I get all the time. My name is Sal. Yeah. I'm from Staten Island. You know, right. I do a prank quote unquote show, which I fucking hate. Right. We don't use the word prank in the office. Right. We're not yeah. allowed to say it. Interesting. It's it's a hidden camera show. Okay. And 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 it's about friends. Right. And that's what it is. Right. And we write the shit out of that show. Right. We improvise, but we write the shit out of it. Of course. But we're not allowed to say because it's non-union. So it's like so it's like they they could put it in under the guise of like they put it in a reality show. Right. So people call when we could do interviews, they call it a prank show, which we don't think it is, and a reality show, which we don't think it is. It's right. a reality when you think of reality show, you think of you know, Kardashian or whatever the they amount are. Of I don't work watch them. that goes into your show. The, the amount housewives, is different. This, that, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. That's just, you know, contrived people looking for, you know, it's contrived, it's produced, and it it's, you know, they're looking for these sound bites and moments of to right. you know, flair right. to, to have, you know, nuggets to put online right. to get viral. I, I, it is what it is. And, it, and there's people that like that. And I've watched reality shows, but we're not that. So, you know, it is what it is. But, um, what was I saying? Oh yeah, but if you judge the island and you don't know much about it, I, I don't I don't like that. Cause this the some of the best, most salt of the earth, wonderful people that I've met here. Some of my lifelong friends here, my family's here. You know, good, good people. Yeah, of course. So just like anything else, there's some shit. There's some shit. Yeah, but it's nice. It's nice. And it's a stone throw from the island, but you get like a bit of the suburbs here. Like if you ever so you've taken the train. I don't know how much you've actually traversed. I've taken the train up and down Staten Island, so yeah. I know the train. I've been yeah. in cars here. But I could take you through like some places, and you would, wouldn't even know you were in Staten Island. Oh, it's beautiful. I've yeah. seen the suburbs, and it's gorgeous. Yeah. I mean, it, there's there, there, there's a lot of history here, which people don't know about. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, no, I, I, I love it here because there's a lot of character here, and I like character. One of my complaints about Manhattan is everything's so corporate now that you, the character is unfortunately has been lessened by that. Yeah. You don't have as many mom and pop stores or little diners or restaurants and the people that would hang out in those places yeah. and the people that would own those places, you're much more likely to find in Queens or Brooklyn or Staten Island. Oh, they're all over here still. Yeah. So those are the characters that to me make New York fun. The people and in your neighborhood. The people in your neighborhood. And the, you know, you, now the people in your neighborhood is like Chase. <laughs> right. You know, or like a you know, three hundred dollar a head sushi place. Right, you know, right, and it's right. like, okay, that's not what I think of when I think about New York. The friendships with the guys, are they all have they changed uh over the uh, over the last thirty years? Is it still the same? It's pretty much the same. Wild. I mean, we're closer than we ever were because we have to be with each other legitimately all the time. Twenty four fucking seven. So is another rule when you pick people to collaborate with, pick people that you can spend time with and people that you can. Oh boy. Yeah. 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 And I think that we do a good job at that despite even our own disagreements, arguments, every occasional blowouts, this, that, the other. You got to understand we are four, not even two. We, we have to, it's a democracy a lot of times, but we trust each other. And a lot of times we'll, if someone is. So there are arguments. Yeah. There are. Ar well, yeah. yeah. There are not too many arguments. There are. Yeah. But, um, but when it comes to the creative part of it, it's uh, we're pretty good. We're pretty good. We'll, we'll convince each other if we think an idea is good and someone doesn't, or we'll give it a whirl, and if it doesn't work, we'll learn from the mistake. But it's not so much um, the creative part as much as is the business side too. Right. Like we have, um, we have collectively probably sometimes anywhere from one, no joke, to one hundred decisions to make a day as a team. Right. So we have learned how to do that 
but every once in a while, it's still like, oh, we hit a stalemate, you know. But it, it's no small feat to be like, sometimes just be asked like 50 questions. There's a lot of people I think that aren't, for whatever reason, aren't ready to take the next step or they're not ready to be successful or they're not ready to have any money. Like, what do you think the challenges are when people don't really understand? Like, there's a lot of people that constantly get in their own way. And that's either subconsciously, maybe fear of success, fear of failure, sabotage. whatever it is, self-sabotage. Yeah. What do you think separates people that are willing to take the next step or ready, really ready? Because a lot of people are willing, they're just not ready. How do you, what makes people ready to make a hundred decisions a day sure. if they need to? That's a big thing. I don't think anyone is ready. Right. Um, and I don't think... If you think you're ready, you're probably not. It's just uh, about a, a, a knowing that you have to be ready whether you like it or not, and then do the best you can. I, w- I wasn't ready for this. No one's ready for it. But I think a big help is to, uh, like you said, f- have a lot of failures. I got, I got this kind of success relatively late in my life. Yeah. So uh, we got the show. I, was I like know a lot 30. of YouTube kids in LA, and they're 23, and they have millions of dollars. That's. I, I think, look. God bless them right. and good luck with them. And I wish them the best. I hope they ma- manage the money and I, and I hope they manage their day to day and their relationships the right way. And they get out on the other end of that because if it's also the way you were raised, I think. Um, and I think that younger people now, and I could be completely wrong and I think everything's cyclical and I think people probably said this about us and people said this about our parents and the rock music and the rap man, all that shit, whatever it is. But I think, I think especially now, kids are being raised um, with the internet, which I think is different than television in the fact that people's opinions, ideas, the world is very six, uh, accessible around them. They're saturated with information, about everything, opinions about everything. And I, and I think that success now is equated with, you know, likes, friends, retweets. And so people are chasing clout now as a kid. I think clout is important to young kids now in a way that it wasn't before. Clout in high school, maybe. Right. Was oh, my thing of that. Right. Clout in the neighborhood. You know what I mean? Right. But not clout globally. Right. And so when kids now are their square one is like, how do I get global clout? Right. right. That is a very, uh, <laughs> right. That's, how, right. That's a great point. Like how can I be a global phenomenon yeah. before? How can I get priorities, good at something? The priorities are never learned. Does it ever worry you? I look at some, uh, you know, I look at comedy and, and where it is right now. And there's so much, and I understand it. I have to do it myself. There's so much of an emphasis on marketing getting yourself out there. It's like comics are learning how to, you know, they're selling t-shirts before they have an act. I mean, everything is like, does it ever worry you about just the future of like art in general, the idea that everything is so fast paced and that you need to really learn. And and the, the emphasis and the focus seems to be on just getting so much stuff out there. Forget whether it's good or not. Forget whether it's, you know, valuable or not just putting stuff out there and everybody's got to see themselves as like you know everybody's got to be like a marketing company and does it ever do you ever wonder like you know where that leads does that lead to just kind of very cheap art eventually i think think, well an argument can be made from every side right because art is so subjective right like that fucking guy that that they nailed the banana to the wall last week and he fucking ate it and like what the what fuck? is that? Yeah. What the fuck? Right. And that's old people. So they're right. fucked up too. Right. They're still selling bananas that's, for a quarter million. Right. Yeah. But I think that someone could, it could be said that, look, every, art begets art and this is all art and take it or leave it. And so, you know, it's whatever someone is into is value. I don't, I think it's a dangerous thing Yeah. because I think that, like I just said, that is the trend from square one. So we already have saturation in the form of how we can access this information. Now there's saturation in the amount of people that are trying to do it as well. Right. And it just, it's, it expounds. It's just, it's to the point where when we first started doing the YouTube stuff and someone put us on, we got a few hundred thousand views. We were like, whoa. And then the MySpace blew up and then they were ranking comedians and then it felt like this gold rush, right? Right. To this type of thing, which is now having a, re- a revolution. It's still going. There's a renaissance of the, like, but I would say, oh shit, like everyone's doing it now. So like now 
how are we going to keep up? And I remember having this conversation with a friend of mine. He's like, look, like anything else, people will rush to it. And then a lot of output will be made. And then the, the best stuff will rise to the top. And, you know, and you'll see like, you know, if it's good, it's good. And that should be the great, the great equalizer. The people will find the good stuff and the trash will fall by the wayside. And those people will give up and you'll, you will get good content from it. I believed that at the time. Now I think we've have a somewhat of an epidemic because now I think that we are so saturated and flooded with content that it's the new normal and people cannot even find the good content or at least it's harder to. And all of these kids now are accepting. And I mean this even, and I'm not calling anyone specifically out. There are very talented uh, internet people, of course. very talented SoundCloud people. It's just that they're also is so much shit, just like anything else. And I think that there's so much shit available that the masses of young people are now just accepting the shit as the baseline good. Right. And they're redefining what is acceptable as quality. Yeah. And they are outnumbering us. We're dying. Yeah. They're not. They're The flourishing. people that spent 20 years to get to where they're going and and I'm only 43. I'm not acting like I'm an old man. No, of course. But I'm traditional. But the people I'm that have really put the time model. in are kind of being supplanted and replaced by people, like you said, that are just kind of like this. But is even the people that are putting great content up on the internet right now are outweighed by one billion teens that are just like turning right. on the camera right. and jump cutting themselves, twirling their hair, right. blowing bubble gum, say, right. slapping their friend in the face with a piece of ham or saying, right. I like this nail polish right. or whatever it is. And now these people are getting 10 billion views yeah. and they cannot be denied by corporations. So they have to give them money because they need views on their thing. And we are changing the landscape we're lowering the bar. We are no one. And, and I think that even someone who's honest with themselves, even someone who's gotten success from that medium should be able to say, well, hopefully, you know, I got success, but there's people, there's frauds out there that have, are successful. have no right to be. We all know that. Of course. And again, that's happened in every iteration. Like even when we were younger, people fall into success that shouldn't be there, I suppose. But, but I just think it's bad because, because, uh, there's this hive mind now that oh this is what this is what is entertaining this is what is quality this is what should be inspiring me this is right. what I'm taking my cues from right yeah you know what I mean yeah so, I, so true. I'm scared because I I like just I don't have it in me to be the guy that's always turning on some of my our friends are really good at it right like um Bert Kreischer amazing at it yeah. Chrissy D Amazing great. at it. Like they're just really good. They turn on the camera. They could say whatever they want. You're you, you're great at it. Yeah. yeah. You, you know, and, but, but I don't have the inclination and maybe, and maybe it's because I, uh, I, I just, um, I, I spread myself a little thin. And so when it comes to like, put this up, promote this, say something funny or let them into my kitchen and see what I'm doing over here or, you know, give them today's quip or whatever. I, I just, I just don't have, I just don't have the, I don't have the motivation to do it. And I know that it's to my own detriment. Like I do it, but I do it like very half-assed. Like I, I'm not going to do all the, I haven't done the Snapchat. I'm not going to do the TikTok. I'm not going to do any, any right. of that stuff. And I'm, I don't even do, I even have issues with Instagram stories. Right. You know, I'll do the Instagram post. Yeah. But luckily I got a little success right now and I, I don't have to like lean on it hard, but for, for live ticket sales, it's everything. Is it sad when you see comics in their mid forties and they're, ju they just have to do this stuff. I don't think it's sad. Right. I think as long as they do it well, right. Then they utilize it. It's always it like, it's well. sad sometimes to see like older Long Island comics who are like, my daughter told me about the YouTube. Yeah, 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 so yeah, hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that, yes. There's, they have two views, <laughs> yes. you know. She's like, subscribe <laughs> to my channel. To your channel. I don't, <laughs> what? Yeah, exactly. They're out of it. Salva so, I really appreciate you talking we, to me. We had way more of a, uh, I, I mean, I, you know, I didn't give you, I don't know if we had any guffaws. I, I wanted to. Uh, no, it's fine. Listen. We chopped it up, but I, you know, I People also want to. People need to know they're going to fail. And that's what my show is about. <laughs> yeah. Like, my show is about. I thought we were going to. I thought we were going to be much more know. like. Hard and My fuck no, around with no, 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 no. I got that too, the baby. Show's I got gotten, that too. The show's funny enough. We've got archives. <laughs> it's very popular. People can laugh. But every now and then, we need to do an episode telling people that they are going to fail. Yeah, you're going to fail. And that's the thing. And people need to know that. And I, and I meet also, so many people. Also, with, pay yeah. attention. The people 
a, the people that know someone that's going to fail, tell them, tell them you're not being a friend. Yes. You're not yes. being a friend to them. Tell them they're going to fail. Tell them, listen to me. I love you. Maybe this isn't for you. This isn't for you. Or at least keep it in mind. Yes. I feel like I, you might hate me, but one day if you mature enough, you will know that I did you a service. The people around the people that are going to fail, tell them. And by the way, if you persevere past that, and you succeed, good. You were meant to succeed. Right. And 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 you needed that to succeed. Right. But the people that aren't going to succeed, just try to be a little more self-aware. The two main lessons from the show are you personally are going to fail, and you should also tell others that they are going to fail. That's true. I, you could encourage them. You could encourage them saying, you know what? Listen. Listen, you could do a lot of things. You could Don't. do a lot of things, yes. Nobody, that's the other thing. Sometimes, you know, there was there was a friend of mine who wasn't doing a lot of stand-up and their friend said something about like, oh, you should do more stand-up or you're, you're hanging out with this person. They don't do, you know, they're not pushing you to do stand-up. But here's the thing with everything. People do what they want. They do what they're good at. And no one can tell anyone what to do. This is the thing that nobody will realize. Nobody could, this is my problem with a lot of these online motivational speakers and things like that. It's all great. I'm glad it pumps you up. It makes you feel good. It's really entertainment more sure. than anything else because a lot of people are going to go to where they're going to go. They might take a weird route to it. Yeah. They might take a straight route to it. They might go, all, you know, some of them might not get there, but they're going to end up where they're kind of going to end up. So this whole collective identity and idea of like, oh, you know, worrying about what other people are doing or worrying about other people influencing you. Like there are no influences. There are influences creatively, yeah. there are influ but you're either going to do it or you're not. Look, there's also, let me look. There's also people that are naturally funny and that's something you can't teach. Right. But there are people that are not necessarily naturally funny, but work hard, learn how to t tell and write jokes and become great at it, excel at it, that are probably even famous right now. Right. I'm not saying to you that if you've tried for five years and haven't made it, you're going to fail and you suck. I'm not right. saying that at all. I am. I'm, <laughs> oh, I'm saying that, I'm saying that just be self-aware. Yes. Like make goals short and long term. See if you're making progress. See if you're, be honest with yourself is all I'm saying. Because if you're half-assing it and and you're not, then you're wasting everyone's time. Right. And I'm just saying like, even if you have to be the friend to be like, look, I want you to succeed. I want you to keep trying. I think you're funny. I think you do have talent. But I, the way that you're approaching it, I don't see something happening for you. And look, if you're strong enough of a person and you're talented enough of a person, that's not going to matter. But right. I just don't want to see someone who's trying a year, two, three, four, five, ten. And um, you got to look down deep and go, why am I really doing it? You need it? a plan. You, by yeah. the way, everyone says that just get on stage. Yeah, get on stage. Just get on stage. That's the first thing. Yeah. But also, you need a fucking plan. Yes. Don't, you can't just be like, ah, oh, people tell me I'm funny or I like to act or I want to be funny. You need a plan every day. Follow the plan. Take notes. See if you're making any progress. You know, you have to do that. Um, and, I, you know, I, I don't know. I just don't want to be like, you know, every, but most no, people are always are, kidding. Listen, most people are not funny. Most if, people, if we're strictly talking comedy, it's hard to make a career out of being funny. Yeah. It is a very difficult thing. It can be done. It is done. <laughs> a, a lot of people will do it, but it's tough. It is not easy. And you got to have a plan and you got to be willing to do everything. You got to like drop all your sacrifice. preconceived notions. Surround yourself with people that are positive and good at what they do and that you can learn from, but not in a way to like these young comics that just become like right. incessant in your face to the point where like, I get that you're hungry and I get that you're trying to make opportunity, right. but you also have to remember that there's a human element to it and you cannot yes. be a savage. Be, just be, make natural friendships, organic natural friendships. Put yourself in a place. If do you're, people do that to you where they're just crazy? Yes. Yeah. And that's, I get it. I right, get it. Right. I get, hey, you think I could help you? Right. Hey, you th even whether it's like, some people are like, can you just get me work? Or really? just put me on a show. Get, make a show for me. <laughs> Let me be on your show. <laughs> make like, a show for me. I, 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 was, I was at the cellar the other day. A guy hits me. I won't name names. I will after we hang up the, yeah. after we hang up the phone here. Yeah. But I won't name He hits me. He goes, hey, how you doing? I said, good. He goes, you're that guy. You're that guy <laughs> from the show, The Prankables. This is what he, he called, like, he literally, like, like, Lunchables. He goes, you're on The Prankables. You're on HBO. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, what are you, what's your name, Ed? I'm like, yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> Sal. What's the name of your show? Now I got to tell him. In practice, that's it. Huge fan. Watch it all the time. Can I get on a show? 
I love I said, it. How so? Like, I'm really funny. Everyone knows I I, I play here. I play here, he says. I, I'm at the cellar. He goes, yeah. I play here. Yeah. He goes, uh, so I, I, can I get on a show? I said, well, the show don't really work that way. You know, it's the, the four of us. Right. We've known each other 30 years and stuff like that. Right. Yeah, no problem. No. Here, here's my YouTube. Here's my card. Look me up. And then he goes, you got a, you got a pen? And I was like, no. He goes, this is my YouTube, but my Instagram is this, but with an underscore, and my other one is this with a that. Look me up tonight. Leave me a message. Let me know. Re- email me. This is my email. I'm, I'm not kidding with you. Wow. Who was sitting with me? Vita was sitting with me. Yeah. And, and he goes, all right. My name is this. I'm, I, 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 I work here. I'm good. You know, everything. And he just keeps, and he's, and I'm like, all right. You know, I, and then. Sometimes people will break into the fucking green room and be like, I just, can I get on your show? Can, can you get, can you give me a show? Wow. So that, don't do that. But go, go to where the people are that you want to be. Hang out, make natural friendships, let people like you for who you are, and then s- stick with those people. Stick with like-minded people, especially if you want to be a comedian. Yeah. Go to the clubs, plant your ass there, write, observe, work, talk. Do it. It might take a long time. Do it. Make those friendships. Then you got to get around like-minded people. You got to. You can't be an island alone trying to do something. You have to change your lifestyle to where everyone else around you is thinking the way that you're thinking. I think that's a, a good accelerator. And I would also say have, like when you said have a plan is so important, but also have an idea of what you want to do and who would out there would enjoy it. Like, yeah. have a concept. Who are you talking to? Who is this for? Who is it for? Who is it for? By the way, I speak like I'm, I'm talking like I'm J- Jerry Seinfeld over here. Yeah. I'm, I'm still young in comedy. I got lucky. I still have all my doubts. I, I don't do everything right. I'm not speaking like some, I'm giving you my experience and opinion, not speaking like I'm the law on this. Right. I still learn every single day and I'm still afraid to fail. And I question all that stuff too. But I, at least I will say that I know that I'm self-aware of it. Yeah. You know what I mean? So just be that at least. You know what be I mean? Be that. Like, yeah. Be that, folks. Be self-aware. It's and so you know funny. what? You I'm, know- I'm, I, I, like, I'm to- I, it's so funny that like, I'm talking. I end up doling out advice like I'm this like so you have, like you successful. Have, you, yeah, uh, like, you have I'm one of the most fucking- successful shows in the history of television. No, yeah, I know. I mean, but that's what do you mean? How, yeah, you know. Yeah, but I mean, no, it's like- But that's not- well, I don't want to come across like- We're conversating. I'm giving you my opinions. No, 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 please do not mistake this for me doling out from my fucking- The people need to be- Held underwater. <laughs> so I mean, I don't know if you the people that are listening to this that this might apply to, they need to have their oxygen cut. You 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 did it. You fucking did it. You get to sit and tell everybody you 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 are more successful than anyone at the cellar. I need to tell you this. Every comedian at the cellar there, whatever they want to do, other than like Seinfeld and a few of them, it's really you. I mean, it, it's the reality. I, I don't well. I mean I, well, mean, well, I mean, there's a lot of people there that are eating pigeons in the park, you know, <laughs> and then having really good sets. But let's get real about it. Let's get real. They're they're going to die. So thank you there's for listening. Lab, we, thank you for listening, what you deserve. everybody. Uh, people will find Sal on Sal Vulcano and a Practical Jokers. You can know I, where he well, is. Can I actually am you about to announce. Can something? I? Can I? Why yes, not? please. I, uh, I'm about to announce uh, my uh, 2020 theater tour for myself uh, soon on Sal Vulcano comedy.com and the guys and I just announced a 40 something city tour of all next summer um and we we got cuz I want your audience to know about this stuff too. Who knows if we share them? Of mom. course. Yeah, and I think the we new do. show Misery and Next on TBS got picked up for season two. My comedy is very family friendly. Joker's is on. Uh, we gotta. We should have talked about that because I also try to have you with me when I can here and there. Of course. And you did the cruise and it, you are fucking yeah, fantastic. And I did good. It was they hysterical. Liked it. Also hysterical, which we didn't touch on. The, the the I think it was a history hyenas you yeah, did after. About the cruise, yeah. So funny. Yeah. Not, ne- we have not to talk about next time. A hundred percent. Um. Yeah. So just the tour. SalvoCanoComedy dot com and. What the fuck else was it? Oh, the movie. Our movie comes out. The, the Practical Jokers film. February 21st. Very good. Yep. Folks, get it, get it, get it. TimDillonComedy.com. All that crap. Tim J. Dillon on Instagram, Twitter. Uh, thank you. Rate, review, subscribe. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> You're going to fail. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>